Welcome, welcome to episode 82 of A Master's Degree in Rolling Terribly. I'm your host, Daddy, and I'm currently in ranged form. Nice and safe. And I really want to use this ranged card, which is going to light up a few monsters. And this bottom to move over here. Oh, but that swapped me into melee form now, so I guess I'll play my last two melee cards before my rest. Oh, but I need to switch back somehow. Oh, a long rest next to the steel automaton. Ah, oh, he doesn't like me. This has worked out terribly. Good thing I can ask this man for help. Gaz, say you're doing fine, Daddy. From Gaz, you're doing great. Keep keep up the great work. Just just keep uh, keep switching. Keep in a bug. Generic office manager response. Yeah. Nah, you are. You're doing doing really well. <laughs> you didn't um die. I mean, I think you did, but um, I mean that's yeah. We'll talk about that later. Um, no, it's, you're doing great. That's what the Gemini is supposed to do. Get stuck in awkward positions and not know what to do. That is... And you know what? I'm not even mad. Um, I find that when I do get put into awkward positions and I don't have the cards or... Yeah, this was the first scenario... Well, I've only played two, but this was the first time that I've actually gone in and just gone, Oh, I can't swap back. That's okay. I'll long rest. Oh, I'm getting... But that means I have to stay in one spot and yeah. right next to this thing that I decided to rest next to. And uh, yeah, it just leads to a... Some uh, problems in my head. The the good thing is that uh, I mean, like I'm probably the one that's mo the the next most familiar with the cards, and I don't even really remember most of them. But <laughs> because most Gemini turns are so random, and there's so many cards that you don't really have a pattern, no one ever picks up what you should or shouldn't be doing. Mm. So like your baseline is not do much. And so when you have a really good turn, it's really like, wow, great job. And then when you do a turn like that and you're like, oh, I'm just going to long rest. So no one really notices that you're resting early or when you just do a move and not do much, people are like, that seems standard. Yeah. Right? Uh, and so you can kind of get away with it because there's like so many different combinations of things you can do. What I have enjoyed, which has been very different, was... Um, Oh, look, it's going to hit Daddy. Oh, it hits Daddy for 10. That's a card. And I'm like, oh, no, which of my 14 cards am I going to use? Like, yeah. that, 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 I don't mind that. I, I just yeah. feel like, because when things get really bad, I'm like, damn it. Okay, I'll get rid of that. Okay, damn it, I'll get rid of that. Oh, I still have a lot of cards going. Oh, I can take another hit. Come on, hit me. What do you got? Mm. And then, yeah, it gets scary when you get down to like four. Like, real scary. Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, and that's where I found, I, I was really um, kind of, fascinated to play it again before we finished up and and that's why it's great that you're doing it because i wouldn't get a chance to um but compared to a lot of the other characters that i've played the gemini doesn't seem to have a lot of combo pieces so like obviously you've got the shifts and you've got key cards that kind of uh give you uh, i don't know bonuses or things that you reuse like he has good cards but where, you know, normally you do a long rest and with most other characters and you're like, oh, but I picked these 10 cards and I want them all, which is the one I don't need. And there's usually one that doesn't fit into your rotation or it's like your loot card or something like that. The Gemini just seems to have all those cards. So <laughs> like all of the cards do a thing, but none of them are really core in that. Like if you lose that one, suddenly now that path of what you want to do isn't going to work mm. outside of the switches. Right, because mm. they're obviously really important. So you got to not burn those if you can help it. But yeah, that's it's interesting because it seems to be the most just do whatever you want as long as it's within the really tight restrictions and rules that the character can do. Yeah, I like that it can be very reactionary and it's very tactical. It's almost like the game state changes and your cards they're all still good. It's mm. rare that you're in a position where you're like, wow, I actually can't. Well, actually, no. You, there are definitely times you can't do anything because range restrictions and element restrictions and things like that but it always feels like you're still always in and you're always contributing mm. uh what i need to get around is um the burn thing it's that it's like when you first played it and you've come from gloomhaven it's this conservative you know attrition based gameplay that you're used to of trying to survive as long as you can um on a character that's built around burning cards and you know this is the second scenario so i'm still getting my head around that yeah. and I've learned a few things from this scenario. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I didn't even really get the hang of that properly in by the end of playing the Gemini. Like mm. it, it is such a it was such a weird mindset. It was completely um like opposite to how I play as well. Mm. Like I generally do play pretty conservative, uh, you know, and 
the idea of like I just needed to like again burn bright, which I haven't really had one of those characters. We've seen a few of them kind of come in and out. I'm kind of like that on the drill now, but because we're all kind of like that now, I'm like, oh, I guess I can't be like that. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not. I don't only have one burn card on the drill, and I don't have any persistence. So it's I'm not playing more cards than I should. I'm just going to run out of cards quicker than everybody else because I have nine card hand. Yeah. So it's a it's a weird again it's a weird situation. Do you think? you would get the three perk on the drill. Hmm. If I had three spare perk points. Yeah, totally. Like it's, <laughs> it's, I think it's a good, it's a, it's a good ability and it's cool. Like I like the idea of it. I really do. I feel like three is just a bit too much considering like, I kind of want to fix my AMD. Right. Yeah. Like I, I need to get that. And there was a couple of other passive ones that I, I got. So, but when yeah, you're pulling misses a, as often as you are, do you really need to fix your AMD? Yeah, that's true. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter, does it? Right. <laughs> no. So, um, but yeah. I think Perka would have helped. It probably could have won us this, this, you know, scenario. Oh, maybe, maybe. But yeah, look, it, it definitely, it's something that I want to get. But now I'm three perk ticks away. I have to save for it. And saving for perks is the worst. Like, it's fine to get those ones when you either, say you you do your battle goal and you get three ticks and you level up so you get two and you're like, oh, great, I'm going to grab that two ticker, you know, or yeah, you create okay. a character and you go, I've got this influx of ticks, I'll chuck it all in there. But just going like, oh, I guess I'll put one tick in the three tick thing and I'll save up for the other two, it feels real bad. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. You're actually getting nothing and yeah. you're like, oh. So now I'm in that weird spot where I'm like, I'm not going to get three in one go, so I have to wait till like I level up and then I get my battle goal, and then I'll still be one short. Look, if I could give you a tick, I would. Yeah. Well, look, Alexander seems to be really generous with the rewards, so yeah, maybe, true. maybe we'll get some kind of cool bonus like that. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see you next week. <laughs> On today's episode, uh, after our dirt sheet, which I've only got one bit of news. Uh, we'll be chatting about a scenario for the week, which was a continuation from last week. This is scenario 97, Program Control Nexus. Uh, we're going to be having a chat about apps and software and programs to help with board gaming and tabletop gaming in general. And we're also covering the next slot in our item, uh, what are we calling it? Bonanza, Extravaganza, something like that, where we point out our favorites and our not favorites of all the different item categories. This week, continuing with Two Handed. We'll call it the hit list and the shit list. <laughs> I like it. All right. The hit list and the shit list. Will that translate into other aspects of the game other than items? Yeah, 100%. Now we have to do it for everything. <laughs> everything ever. Everything ever. Yep. Yep. Top three on the hit list and top three on the shit list. Nice. Well, we'll start off with the dirt sheet. So, uh, this arrives... That's exciting. I didn't even know that. See? So I'm learning at the same time everyone else is. So uh, for those who can't see, I'm holding a shrinked copy of Crimson Scales Gloomhaven, which we are very, very excited for. We put a call out ages ago asking for um, if anyone knew that one that we could purchase. And Joshua Levinson put me in contact with, well, him. And um, <laughs> helped to sort out... Sort us out a copy. So thank you so much. Um, I'm looking forward to unboxing this. And uh, yeah, I, I've got a thing and I've read a bit of the rule book to see the changes. I'm looking forward to sharing that with you because I want to see what your response is to some of the special, unique aspects yeah, okay. of Crimson Scales will be. Should I read the rule book? Um, well, has it really been a problem so far? Yeah. Like a hundred percent it has. Like, uh, I mean, I, uh, it's, it's not the end of the year and I still have time to fulfill my new year's resolution of reading the rule, the Frosthaven rule book. Yeah. Um, but so should I just do a double whammy and read the Frosthaven rule book and then read the Crimson Scales rule book? Start with the Frosthaven one. If you can get through that, then yes. Cause a lot okay. of, a lot of the rules in Frosthaven and Gloomhaven also carry over to this, like some of the core ones, but like playing two cards and top and bottom and things <laughs> like that. So yeah, I, I'd recommend definitely getting through Thanks. those before you jump to this. Development wise, this is in between Gloomhaven and Frosthaven, right? I believe so, yeah. So this doesn't have, have like Crimson Scales doesn't have like Ward and Region and Bane and stuff. No, I think it does. I think that Frosthaven may 
I could be completely wrong here, but in the rule book when I was looking at it, there I think either Ward or Regen or one of them or both of them um, were also in this, which Frosthaven then may have adapted from Crimson Scales. Ah, okay, cool. So you heard this it here first, Daddy's claiming. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> make I, stuff up. I read the rule book a while back and I was like, oh, that's interesting. So that that was also, that was before Frosthaven, but I'd have mm. a look at it again. And this is what happens yeah. when you record and without preparation. So. Without, <laughs> well, I mean, there's been 80 something episodes in. Why would we change that now, right? So we'll, change the we'll, formula. We'll let, uh, we'll let people tell us how wrong we are in the, uh, in the, the comments so yeah but look that's that's really exciting um and yeah really keen it looks like legit like you know not like print and play so and then you got your miniatures away oh it's got minis yep oh yes <laughs> it's funny my daughter was just saying to me um last night she's like oh have you packed up all of your mini painting stuff you haven't done anything ages i'm like ran out of stuff to paint oh, which no. i haven't because i like any <laughs> person that has any miniatures at all i have a massive like uh backlog like essentially like the, the shelf of shame or whatever you call it in board gaming um your nose from lying just then is just like way off the screen i have nothing yeah hundred percent hundred percent i have so much stuff that i could paint um but i'm still new to painting like i am still new to doing it and and the frost haven minis are like the things that i've painted the most so it's kind of been what i've been focused on and when they ran out i was like oh okay i'll just take a break but now we can paint those yeah, and we can paint those. First, That's you can exciting. start off with the astral. Um, you can start. start off no, there. I, you had enough chances for me to paint that. I, 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 like, I, I so just so everyone knows. Yeah, I know. Daddy with usually paints his minis, and and I paint mine and the ones that sometimes the ones that Mark and um and Phil play. And uh, then the astral came out. It looks really cool, and it's got heaps of green. And I like green's my favorite color. I love green. And uh, I was like, oh, wow, that's going to look awesome. And then Daddy didn't do it. And then he didn't do it again. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, no, I will. I was like, do you want, like, I'm happy to paint it. Like, I would enjoy painting. No, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. And I was actually thinking one time of taking it, like, at the end of the session and just painting it and then bringing it back. But I was like, if he actually wants to do it, like, if I legitimately wanted to paint something and then I didn't, and then you just took it and painted it, I'd be like, oh, I really kind of wish you didn't do that. Um, and so I didn't want to put you in that situation of being like, thanks, but you're actually a dickhead, right? Gotcha. Um, and so I was like, oh, I was just <laughs> going to leave it unless he says, yeah, you know what? Give it a crack. Go ahead. And I think it's an achievement. I have played through it and retired it and it's still gray. Actually, true. You're not playing it anymore, so I can paint it. Yeah, sure. You can yeah. do it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, that's really, really cool. Let's, uh, we'll go over that in the next uh, week or so and um, just... Get mentally prepped and excited for for that. Although, in our topics on Discord, I think it was topics, um, a certain Dwarf74 did say, look, before you start that, maybe you should do the community campaign, which I haven't really looked into, but it sounds like it's like a small community-driven campaign that everyone's enjoying at the moment. So we'll have to look into that. And, you know, we did say when people make suggestions and all that, we, we listen, which is a bit scary. Damn but it. Can know. we go back and edit that part out? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Okay, we can. I can tell him we did it, and then just send him like photos of someone else doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. See how long we can fake playing the community <laughs> campaign yeah, for? Yeah, like, oh, there's that Algox um, song guy minstrel. Yeah, so yeah. cool. Did you, did you, did you? That my favorite part of that scenario was with the monsters and the rooms mm. and the doors, and then people were like there was no doors in this one. Like, damn it. <laughs> No, the community Just campaign has been single-handedly run by Matthew Summers, and um, yeah, everyone's real mad at it. <laughs> <laughs> all, uh, right. all right, off to scenarios 97. So we had, it was a linked scenario, so we didn't do any events um, with this one. Why do we do this? I've written my own previous version because I just think it's like just as good, if not better, than Dwarfs. I actually haven't read Dwarfs one. Uh, but we broke into an underground station. We ran over a few drakes and imps and things got messy. We cleared the station and found ourselves being berated for our hygiene and now apparently we must be purged, which is a sign of good service as we are guests. This is a very super considerate location and um, staff, I guess, that we are, we are now surrounded by. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alexander Theo Harris designed this scenario. He's designed this chain, and we've already talked about him enough. Our scenario goal: the scenario is complete when the program director uh, is dead. At the end of that round, read a thing. This is the guy that really wants us to be purged. Uh, robot. 
Scenario effect, there is none. Monster combinations, we had the actual program directed themselves. It is a boss scenario, so therefore we will have boss special, uh, the boss special deck put in. Um, we've got Flaming Blade Spinners, Ruin Machines, Steel Automatons, and Robotic Bolt Shooters. So it's an absolute unfettered jamboree, one that you can probably, um, I don't know, you'll be fine. Yeah, I'm like there as well. I'm like, what do you mean, robot bad guys? What, what is the clo the draw meant to be closest to? Like, I, I dare say it's a Ruin Machine, right? It has to be. Um, yeah, Quite probably a, like combination between a Ruin Machine and like a Steel Automaton. Oh yeah, that's a good point. I forgot about those. They're also bipedal. Uh, monster combination, uh, sorry, first room setup. So we have three whole tiles that are slotted together. It's all visible. There's no doors or anything like that. And there are robots absolutely everywhere of all the different varieties that we've talked about. There are four pressure plates that are spread around the arena, each one with a letter on it. And the boss is up the back and he is guarding two traps for some reason. <laughs> Special rules. Whenever any character ends their turn occupying a pressure plate, Reveal up to two monster ability cards from the matching monster type linked to that pressure plate. So the pressure plates have been assigned a monster for setup. So A tokens for body bolt shooters, B for steel automatons, C for ruin machines, D for flaming blade spinners. At the end of each round, for each monster type on the map, any character uh, at the what at the start of each round for e sorry start of each round. I don't know where end came from. At the start of each round for each monster type on the map, any character may play one of the corresponding monster ability cards from their hand to determine that monster type's action for the round, instead of revealing one card from the monster ability deck. If the monster ability deck is empty, a character must play a card. Uh, whenever a character plays a monster ability card, all monsters of that set become allies to you and enemies to the program director until the end of that round. Monsters of that set are still allies to all non-boss monsters and enemies to the rest of your non-monster allies. So effectively, yes, the, the monsters that you now control uh, have the focus, instead of it being you, they will focus on either the program director or one of your allies, which is not yeah. a monster. So like the TLDR of all of that is that there's pressure plates you stand on, you get on a card from the monster deck, and then at the start of your turn, you can play it if you want, instead of drawing a, a monster card for them. And if you do that, they do what's on the card. Um, but for that turn, you're their ally, so they won't attack you. They do attack the rest of your party. That's one of the things that we did realize really, really early on. It's just you. So you can't just use, it's not like you're on our team now. It's like you're on my team now. Mm -hmm. uh, so they will attack the other party members or the program director, but mm -hmm. they won't attack the other monsters. That's right. Um, and the program director will also attack them because yes. they kind of become enemies. So it's kind of like mind controlling one type of monster mm -hmm. for a turn in a sense, because you don't get to control them. It's just yeah. like you, you get to, so yeah. It, it, they still it's run a, on it's, AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. It's kind of like, you know, putting a, a bit of a virus in the, the whole program. So the final twist to this is the program director, which is the boss, only suffers half damage rounded down from all attacks. Keyword attacks, uh, except for those performed by the actual monsters which is very cool. Uh, the program director, which is also the objective, you know, Slicey Dicey, has two boss cards as per normal boss etiquette. Boss special one, which focuses on the farthest enemy with an adjacent empty hex, and then he teleports to the empty hex closer to the focus and does an attack plus zero and targeting two people. Boss special two, the program director is an ally to all monsters this round, even if the character played a monster ability card for them. So this overrides um, when you decide to play a card. Uh, it then performs a teleport to any empty hex closest to its focus, and that does a smaller attack targeting all adjacent enemies. And we fucked that up. <laughs> we did. So we Classic Amdurt style. I, I, the way that I found out that we stuffed this up just to kind of uh, explain the thought process is that we played the whole scenario and mm -hmm. then Deddy sent me a screenshot yesterday of, of these two abilities and just said, hey, have a read of this. And I was like, okay, cool. And I read them. I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's what we did. And you're like, have another read of them. I was like, <laughs> okay. And I read them. I'm like, yeah, okay. And I didn't say anything because I'm like, clearly we've stuffed something up here, but I don't know what it is. So I was like, <laughs> let me read them a third time. And then I read them the third time and I was like, oh, boss special two is closest. So we were playing both of them as furthest. 
Um, so they both focus on the fathers with either boss special one or boss special two. They focus on the fathers to do their teleport and attack, which means pretty much six out of eight rounds, the boss is going to teleport to the person or the, t- the focus who is the furthest away, whether it be us or, or one of our allied monsters, um, and do his attack, which means this thing pretty much every round is blinking from one side of the room to the other, um, yep. which is not how this works because only no. one special is doing this. The That's other one correct. is not. The other one is basically he'll teleport maybe one or two hexes to the closest thing and stay within the general area so that you can pan him just a little bit more. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's two will still mean that he optimizes targets and jumps forward a couple of things to try to hit everyone. True. But you're right. Not where we have had these situations where it was jumping from one side to the other. So yeah, yeah, it definitely makes a difference. I don't know how much of a difference, like it, it's, it's different but I don't know how much it changes overall what was happening because I'm not sure if there was a lot of situations where like, oh, damn, he's just gone to the other side of the room again. Mm. Um, but, I mean, it's a pretty major thing. So maybe I need to bring one of my kids so they can read the cards to us. Maybe. Can you give them the rule book as well? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts just in general on these rules that you've learned at the start of the scenario? Um... Yeah, no, it seems cool. Like it, it, uh, it definitely seems like, um, like, so it's a boss scenario and we've talked about boss scenarios before and about like how to make them interesting, what we can and can't do, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the rules for this one make this seem like a not, uh, like there's multiple paths, which is cool, right? Like you can, you can just like hammer into the boss you can try to play the game with controlling the robots and manipulating the board. Mm. Um, you also have decisions about, well, you can't just ignore all the robots. Uh, just, uh, I mean, from a visual perspective as well, because it wasn't until we actually sat down and looked at the board, the pressure plates you need to stand on to get these cards, two of them are kind of close, and that's for the ruined machines and the bolt shooters. The ones for the spinning um, Beyblade things and the steel wolves, they're over, like, the other side of the map. Mm. So... It's not an option to, like, turn one, I'm just going to go control all the Beyblades, right? Because, like, I mean, you could, but you'd need something with a lot of movement, but also probably invisibility, because they're going to die. Yep. Um, so it's interesting in that you you do have decisions to make, um, but you kind of need a form of strategy, um, which is kind of, it becomes this whole... Uh, and I mean, some of this is with knowledge about how we played it, but just thinking about the scenario and the start and the rules, it, it is creating this, like, what do we do? And yeah. I like, I like at the start of a scenario when we can actually sit down and go, well, what's our plan here? It's not obvious. Yeah. It's not uh, like, you know, if we think about the last scenario and I, the last scenario was fun, but we were in a room with a car that was going to go to a door. There was not that many options. It's like, okay, we need to kill these monsters here and push the cart to the door that's that's what we do right yeah. and then and that's what frost haven and gloom haven tend to be a lot of there are a lot of get to objective a and then get to objective b and then get to objective c and then you have a win condition right that's usually mm. and and the objective a a lot of times the door Whereas it, uh, Frosthaven has thrown this up a lot, but this scenario is a good example of that of like here is everything here are all of the pieces we are not hiding anything right make a plan yeah and it's not at the point where you can math it out like you can't go oh it's all right i've solved this right yeah. because there's so many variables based on all the monsters what they draw what the boss draws and whatever else does that you, it's it is really a, like we've got to have a plan and we've got to work out whether we stick to that so yeah from an initial perspective of the rules how it's all set out it seemed really cool from a uh this is going to be an interesting to play scenario and how we're going to work it out yeah yeah, well said, actually. Well said. I, I really like that a lot, the way you've um, pointed out that the scenarios that are very obvious is to have what your objective is. And this one in particular could not be further from that, in that it's literally, what are you going to do? And and we're going in also with char- characters that, I mean, what, what do you remember? Uh, I'll let you just quickly announce, uh, what was our party makeup at the moment and what levels were there, everyone? Uh, I think I'm on like a level five drill. Yeah. Uh, you're on like a level four Geminate. Yeah. Second scenario ever. Uh, yeah. I feel Mark's on a level five shackles. Yeah, or probably. Four, four or five. Yeah. And Phil 
Is like still level five or is he level six now? I, think I feel he's like six. He's, he's been. I feel like he's been like level five for like twenty <laughs> scenarios. He keeps saying, no, "I'm not online yet." So he might be six now. Um, and so. he's in the blink blade. Yeah, so. I, I just can never remember, and I was just curious if you were good at remembering that. Um, but I remember it, some things really well. Hmm. Oh, definitely. <laughs> uh, pets wise, we had Watt who gives uh, the lightning eel, who gives us our card back, and. Um, uh, take two damage and everyone can take a card, recover a card from the discard, which is always pretty cool. Uh, and we have Weedy as well, who's plus one to shield um, for the round. So it's kind of like thoughts on this scenario. It's kind of like where, where it's a very cool boss scenario from the, from the look of it, right? But burning it down is not going to be easy because of the half health shenanigans that are coming with it. So it's kind of like, do we lean into the pressure play bullshit or do we not? Um, but the idea, this is a unique situation where you're controlling, um, the robots, which we haven't been in the situation of doing it. Like I'm thinking, you know, how mind snippers can do that with us. And then with, uh, I think mind thief as well from Gloomhaven can control a monster and make it attack another one. This is kind of a cool one where it's almost like, yeah, no, you're friends with all the monsters. They'll still do the AI, but it's almost like you've gone into a summon character mm. that if they die, who cares because you're just, you know, catapulting yourself further along as a group to the victory conditions of, of clearing things out. So I think it's, it's very, very, very cool. Um, is there any preparation you did going into this? Uh, no, I looked to change cards, but I don't think I did. I've got mm. my cards pretty set now with the drill. So, yeah. um, that's, that's the other interesting thing going back to when you were saying, um, about this particular scenario and going into it and having a plan and a strategy and all that kind of stuff. We are still relatively new to a lot of our characters. So we we're discovering synergies and discovering that, that, um, that process where things just line up and helping each other to get the best of our abilities is still a little bit, um, untapped. Mm. I think it's fair to say. So yeah, when it comes to actually choosing a scenario and, and what our plan is, I think we are basing it purely off what the mechanics are and let less on what our team can do. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we yeah, did this on what, plus one? No, I think we went on plus two. Oh, okay. I think we started on plus two. Maybe we dropped it down to plus one. That makes more sense. I think it, I think it was like that. I think yeah. It was, um, yeah. Because we, we actually had two attempts at this. Yeah. You were about to say something and I interrupted you. Oh, no, no. I was going to say that back on the question of um, how did I feel at the start of this? Mm. All of the things that I said still stand and are true. The one part, though, that got us stuck, and I know we're going to talk about this in more detail later on, which is the like um, logistics of managing the special rules in this one. Yeah. Um, that's the part that I think uh, created... I won't say friction because that's not the wrong right word, but it definitely was a speed hump for us getting in, jumping in straight away. And that's of no fault of the scenario or the design of the scenario. That's based on how we use the tools available to do it, which I'll let you jump into because I know you you got those a bit of a topic. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean that as like, a, as a whole. No, you can you can go into that now if you want. Like so, basically. Yeah. So in, essentially, like we use X Haven, um, mm -hmm. so we have a, a monitor that has X Haven on it, and X Haven for those that aren't don't use it or not familiar with it, it basically controls all the monster ability decks, um, the player health uh, and statuses and all that kind of stuff, um, and also the attack modified deck for the monsters uh, and allies if they're in, right? Um, and so we have that on a screen, and what we found is because in this scenario we need to draw cards for the monsters as per normal but when we stand on a pressure plate we've got to take a card or two you take the top two cards and mm. then you pick one of them and i assume the other one goes in the discard um but you then hold on to that so we needed a way in x haven to be able to uh keep drawing cards as normal for them but then also have pull a card out that we could do. So look at the top. It was uh, it was kind of like, how do we manage that in there? And we looked through it and we couldn't really figure out how to do it properly. Not not in a way that was going to make sense and uh, be less work. So we ended up opting with the idea of we just brought out the, the physical decks, which we don't use. Which 
just quickly jumping in there, Xhaven does have a little thing that pops up for any pop-ups like persons connected and persons dropped out and things like that. And anything that's scenario related, like reminder, this is this round, spawner, you know, flame demon or something like that. Um, it does come up with a thing that says you will need the physical cards for this, which um, we didn't not see that. That was, that, mm. that was there um, to, as a reminder, but yeah, carry on. Yeah, and so what we ended up in the situation was is that we only have used Xhaven, which means that we are very focused on uh, what's on that screen, right? And and maybe this is a bit of a crutch that we've used and kind of created for ourselves in that not using the physical components. But we don't track monster health with those little dial things and little tokens. Um, we don't track our own health on our character cards. Um, you know, we don't uh, do the monster AMD um, and the monster ability decks in physical. So like all of that stuff is is taken care of. We still do it, but it's digital. Now we had to switch, and we found the transition awkward. And I think by the end of it, we're okay, yeah, right? Because we we, we found a system basically where we use them for decks in. X Haven, we can flip through the cards to choose the correct one. So X Haven was really just being used to represent what had happened where we're using the physical decks to actually do it. So that yeah. kind of worked. And it just meant a little bit of dragging for the initiative because that was the other thing is that Xhaven also, once you put all that information in and click flip card, it gives you the, uh, puts everything in order, mm. right? So the monsters and the characters, depending on what your initiative is in. And so by the end of it, we had a bit of a rhythm, but it definitely was a challenge for us. And that's again, based on, like the tool we have used, decided to use for this, which isn't an official tool, right? No. Um, the, that became a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. Um, but that was probably the biggest, I'll say hurdle, right, in getting into this scenario. And yeah. that was completely our, I won't say our fault for lack of a better term. Yeah. Right? So... Yeah. It was probably the first, because we've had instances of this which Xhaven, and uh, none of this is slamming Xhaven at all. This is just a scenario that just did, required a very cool, unique concept that the Xhaven app just can't do or, or is not designed to do um, at the moment anyway. And we just had to come up with a workaround, which worked. It worked, but it just, like I said, took a while for us to get into it. And now it would be easy. I don't want this for every scenario ever again. Yeah. Um, but that's what you said, the crux of relying on an app or something to, to make it easy. And trust me, I still couldn't live without it. I am not about to, you know, go, you know what, this is too, we're relying too much on this. Let's go back to shuffling monster ability cards and, and all that stuff yep. again, because that was one of the issues I had with, um, the original Gloomhaven was early stages when you've got so many things to track and you're so overwhelmed with things that are going on. Um, you pull a monster ability card and it has a little tiny refresh icon on the bottom right. And you just, for some reason, skip over it and you pull another one. And the next minute, yeah, you've you yeah. messed things up that way. And the fact that the app just takes all of that away um, and makes you not worry about it is fantastic. Yeah. And uh, like it, I was thinking about it during, I'm like, oh, it's annoying they don't have these little features like being able to remove a card and then shuffle a deck and then change cards, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, we've done 80 something scenarios, right? Like it's a this is the first time this has come up in those. And I feel like putting a, a feature into the app and developing it for that, for this one scenario, that's a side scenario is probably not important. Mm. Right. So it's not worth the resources to go into it. So I don't, I don't begrudge Xhaven for not facilitating this. Um, yeah. And I feel like it's one of those things. It's just work around it for one scenario and then you're good. I'm curious, I, I probably will look into it and we'll probably get told, but there are other programs that people are using and Secretariat was one that we did use, which definitely had a lot more detail to it. It mm. seemed a lot more, uh, X7 feels a lot more bare bones next to it, but it's reliable. And one of the main reasons we swapped from Secretariat to X7 was, and we haven't looked back, it was a very long time ago, was the connectivity. It was easier to connect multiple devices to it. We had a lot of issues doing that with Secretariat and that was a really important thing that we wanted because we're all focusing on a screen um, and it's just easier when everyone can put their own initiative in and also track their own XP and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, the, the, uh, they maybe have already got solutions from other apps is what I'm saying. Mm. Um, it's just X7 yeah. doesn't, and I don't necessarily think it needs to, especially if it's just one scenario. Yep. There is a workaround. If you need help with it, um, contact either guys and I, um, if you're planning on doing this scenario and you haven't done it yet, and we can explain exactly how we did it. Um, but yeah, so our first run, I'm just going to a couple of key points again. So 
what's really funny is that because boss special one, boss special two, both of them teleport to us. I think it was round one. Boss is now right next to me because I'm started at the back and punchy punchy. And it's just like, oh, okay, cool. That hurts a bit. It's like doing attack sixes on me. It always pulls a plus one. Sometimes if it's lucky, it pulls a plus two and, and things kind of hurt. This kind of ruins Geminate's efficiency because I wasn't planning for him to do that, but of course he did do that. And then of course I kind of like things at a certain range and we're really boxed in in the corridor. So yeah, this is something I need to get used to is the idea of probably doesn't help that. I don't even know if you know this, but I had slow poke in that scenario as well as a, as a, oh. <laughs> as a thing. <laughs> so the fact that we hung around in that first corridor as well, the whole time was fine. But there yeah. were times where I was just like, I need to get out of here. But at these early stages of character development, you really need those ticks. Yeah. Oh my God. So it was just kind of like, am I booking us by constantly getting smashed by this guy? Um, and the answer is possibly. That's funny. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, things were getting like rough from that first attempt and um, the boss was messing us up. Uh, we had Mark on his shackles who was getting absolutely reamed and um, Bling Plate as well was having to burn. Um, considerably. If you feel, remember, he had like two coming out of this card when he had the burn. It was yep. a real um, mess up. So we had to restart and then we yep. kind of went again with a bit more of an idea of what we were going to do, especially regarding pressure plates and all that kind of stuff. Um, do, do you have anything you want to say about uh, any of this? No, nah, they're they kind of the two runs blur together for me quite a lot because we, uh, we get, we, both of them, we got really clumped up in that uh, yeah. kind of transition area between the first room and the second room because you've got like a steel automaton you've got a whole bunch of robots depending on how quickly they move they will come in right in front of us yeah so there's a whole bunch of stuff there that we um we kind of grouped around to fight um i think in our second run though the plan was a little bit more of let's go get some of those cards um what highlights that stopped that was i think both times phil was like i'm gonna go get a card the boss pulled special one. Now, special one goes later, right? That's like 40, 50 or something like that. Um, and on it, it says that uh, in addition to teleporting next to the first person away and it's doing attack seven or six or whatever on two targets, it also says anyone standing on a pressure plate takes trap damage, which I think is like six damage when we were playing, something like that. So it feels like, oh, I don't want to take six damage. And so didn't do that, right? Which makes sense, right? You, you can see damage on the board. You can choose whether you do or don't take it. The problem was is that that happened, I think, twice through the the that run, and it really meant that we didn't get again didn't get to interact with those things. No. Um, and then, and this is, I, I mean, probably just due to lack of planning and communication. But the, I think the next turn, then I was like, okay, I'm going to go jump on one of these plates and get some cards. So I did, and I went and jumped onto the ruin machine one, got the ruin machine card, and then we killed all the ruin machines. So I was like, oh, okay, well, the pressure plate I'm on now is useless. And I think maybe I played the card, but he pulled boss special two, so it didn't matter. But, like, that's the communication piece. It's like we can't not kill them because they're all up in our face. So it's yeah. like working out whether those cards are useful or not and how they're useful because we need to be able to – we can't just sit there and just get wailed on by these – these um Real machines. And I actually, I think maybe in the second run they pulled their explosion card. Um, which they did. That, they all did, they didn't all explode, but that definitely killed one of them. Plus a couple were on low life. And then I think Phil just ran around and just went like, you know, smash, smash, smash and killed the the remaining ones. So that was, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's just a weird, like it was a weird kind of turn in events and sequencing that wasn't anyone's fault. Um, and it's kind of maybe due to a little bit of lack of communication and planning from our sense in that we need a plan to go forward so that we can kind of know what we're doing. But it ended up just like a whole bunch of kind of wasted turns. It, we got cooked a little on the RNG because I don't think there was one single turn where, because it was only you and Phil that ended up on the pressure plates that was getting the monster cards. I don't think there was one time that you guys successfully got it off without boss special two coming in. Yeah, uh, I can't remember a time when we had to AI, oh, this is going to go hit Mark instead of, you know, you or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It was just convenient. So that one whole thing that we were starting to try, which was leaning into the mechanics of the scenario. Um, I mean, there's clearly a counter there. We knew that going into it, but it's just very convenient how often that boss special two comes out. And boss special two is always the worst with everyone. Yeah. It's also the fastest. So yeah. it's just, it's nuts. Yeah, not only does it, it 
So him pulling boss special too, not only does it screw you over because if you played a monster AI card, uh, it, it basically says no, but he also then goes before you. So even if you wanted to do something before he had his turn, you don't. So yeah, it is a, um, it is a bit of an interesting one. Um, and I guess learnings from that into us doing it, like what we probably need to look at is the steel automatons and the blade spinners are the ones we want to control because they seem to hang around the longest. Yeah. Right. The others die too quickly to warrant really doing anything. And there's so many of them that they're probably not really getting that much in on the boss. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it'd be great if like we could get a ruined machine or two to go explode themselves on him. But mm -hmm. that would be heaps of damage. But that's that's kind of magical Christmas land, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so yeah. So it wasn't like that. Um, bolt shooters seem to pull their same person hit multiple times, kind of thing, which was really bad because Mark is kind of working as a pseudo tank on the shackles at the moment, playing a different style to me. And the problem with shackles is they don't have a lot of damage mitigation. They've got burst heals to get themselves back up and retaliation. So when you're taking an attack three like three or four times. Um, it can be a little brutal depending on the, those card flips, um, which kind of sucks a little bit. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah, the Ruin Machines kind of did their self-destruct next to Mark as well. So he was copying an absolute, like, earful um, from that. Automatons have their shield plus three or something or plus four. So they're annoying to get through. We don't have a lot of pierce options. Oh, we, we, we do, but in a scenario like this, it was just so hard to work out where the priority was lying mm. in terms of are we wasting them on a 25 health steel automaton here or are we going to try and throw them into the boss and it kind of yep. was a bit confusing um and then of course there's the corridor of absolute doom so one of the biggest pet peeves that i experienced from this especially during setup is that there's two corridors that lead from the starting hex to the the, uh, the starting tile to the second tile and there's two corridors there and in between there's a wall this tiny little thing during the setup and I had to point out that's a wall everyone etc and in my head I was like huh we'll see who that messes up messed me up the most it was so infuriating that every time I was there I was like oh that thing's actually blocking my LOS that's really annoying or I've got you know a burn that's going to burn three things in a triangle formation but I can't because that fucking thing is in the way and because we never left or it was really difficult for us to leave that front tile um, we just sort of sat there. I mean, people who have more maneuverability and don't have slow poke as a battle goal probably could jump into the main arena and actually partake in, you know, pressure plate usage and, and clever, all that kind of stuff. No, here I am navigating around a corridor, uh, similar to the matrix in that room in the hotel lobby or whatever it was where I'm trying to peek around this corridor and be like, come on, I know you're here somewhere. I'm going to try and snipe you. So that was super frustrating. Half damage on the boss, also super rough. Um, it's rounded down. It's nothing worse than going, oh, I'm going to attack for five. I'm going to pull a plus zero and I do two damage. Yeah. Thank goodness this thing doesn't heal. But when you're going through, I think at our difficulty, I think uh, plus two will start off at just over a hundred health. And then it drops to just over 90 health when we drop mm. down to plus one. It's still a lot. That's 180, you know? Mm. And this is where the shackles came in handy because the shackles has a lot of pure damage. But the rest of us, not so much. Nah. Which definitely makes it really, really difficult. Anyway, yeah, and we, we've got no, yeah, Brittle yeah. as well. Like, we don't have access to Brittle anymore. I can um, Brittle myself. Yeah, cool. Uh, so, I mean, maybe take that knife thing. That let's, Oh, no, you can't transfer Brittle. I think that's one of the things you can't do, right? No. Um, so, yeah, it's a... Um, oh, we need... What was those robes that I, like, binned? Um, the ones robes where you... Doom. Yeah, yeah, you Mark take damage. Those. This, does he? Oh, yeah. I need to yeah, buy them. Uh, don't know. I okay. Sure. We just covered this. But yeah, like ago. that's what we need. We need that. We need stuff like that to put brittle on it. Um. But yeah, it was. It, it was rough, and it was constantly this. Um. It's an interest con interesting conundrum, right? Because you're talking about whether you hit a monster, like for example, the um steel automatons, which have like th two or three shield, and you go, okay, I've got an attack three. Do I hit them and do no damage, or do I hit the boss and do one damage? <sighs> like, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it's not bad. It's just like a. I feel like both of these decisions are shit, mm. right? Um, and uh, and that's where we were constantly like, well, um, you may as well throw the damage into the boss, right? Yeah. Because you're probably going to do at least one or two, um, and that's like good compared to what we're doing. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it is it was rough. Yeah. So due to various reasons, I just dropped something. Um, I exhaust 
uh, fuel exhausts, gas exhausts, uh, not before helping out the last ditch effort with Mark. Uh, and then Mark is the only one left and the boss has got like 11 health, which is actually like 20 plus. And yeah. Mark couldn't do that much in his last round and everything's closing in. And yeah, and, and we wipe. And this, for some reason, this was the fight that reminded me of WoW. It was like, you know, when you're doing 20 attempts on a raid boss and you get the boss to 3%, but the part, the most of the raid is dead. And you've yep. got a few people, you've got like a, a little off tank in there. He's not the main tank, he's the off tank. You've got two DPS in there who are like that much mana left and they're just sitting there trying. And you've got one healer who's also that much, who's panicking. And he can manage to get everyone's health from 10% to 25, but he's got to keep targeting between them. That's what it reminded me of. The end, we just couldn't get it done. And it was like, oh, 3%, 3%, you know, we have to go again. So... Yeah, it was very, very, yeah, very yeah. yeah cool it's a, a really good analogy. It is because when you're in those situations in the raid and you're dead, right? You're looking at that one percent, and watching. you're like, and you're like one percent. That's so close. And then you're looking like ten million health, and you're like, <laughs> oh, okay, that's still a lot. I mean, in comparisons, but it's not. If we can do this, and you're seeing it chunk down, and then yeah, you wipe on one percent. You're like, ah, oh, yeah, that's a that, shame. Yeah, I guess we're weird. doing this again. Yeah, it's such a crushing feeling. So I'm glad mm. it took me back to that game that made me feel that crushing feeling over and over again once a week. Or well, was it twice a week? I can't remember. Yeah, we have to do it twice a week. Well, like, yeah, <laughs> especially when we're doing that dance one. <laughs> so the summary uh, at the end, because we didn't clear it, we did fail um, for the, the second attempt and we called it up there. So summary, we, we have no idea. We don't know what's going to happen after this. We don't know what the rewards are. What were your thoughts on scenario 97, Gaz? I think it's really good. I think uh, I would love to do a tier list of our boss scenarios by the end of it. Um, but if I th was to think about um, some of the more enjoyable or well-designed boss scenarios, this is definitely going to rank up there. Um, Cause I think about memorable ones and things that had go things going on with it. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. It's, it's a, it's very puzzly. It's very tricky. Like it's hard, um, which is good. Um, Cause we, you know, we've talked a little bit about it. we made it different. harder, yeah. Well we, well, we, yeah, we made it, we definitely made it harder or different, but like it's, it's a difficult one. So yeah, no, yeah. I've, I've enjoyed it so far and I'm looking forward to having another crack at it following the actual rules, but then also kind of with a, again, hopefully we get a bit more clearer strategy about what will and won't work and we can kind of execute. Yeah. I, I think, um, what, I don't want to keep making it sound like we're fanboys of Alexander too much, right? And that's all we, you know, he could shit on a plate and we'd be like, oh my god, that's so brilliant. Um, but I think this was a thematic masterstroke. It was, you got the boss, you've got all the monsters there. It looks like a uh, us against all, uh, us against the world kind of thing. It looks like we're like overwhelmed with what's here mm -hmm. and we actually have to be really clever with it. But the way that you've got this, um, the pressure plates, which are supposed to be like stat cards of the actual monsters that we can actually get to and control and then put, you know, turn the machines against the thing, uh, the boss, um, the program director. I, I just loved it. I just think thematically it was, it was really, really phenomenal. Um, it got me thinking though, is the mechanic that's built into it, and this will get me onto community feedback later, is it too much of a mechanical gimmick when you can burn the boss down, which is something we didn't try. Um, but also I don't know if we've got the tools needed to do that. Well, we kind of did try that, right? Like we didn't really control them at all. So we did it by accident. We didn't focus in on like, hey, let's just chill and like, don't worry about anything else, just burn the boss. We'll kill everything else. And we tried to use the mechanic and we failed at it. And then so we only ended up putting damage in the boss. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I, at the moment, I would say maybe it is not uh, like it's easier. No, not easier. Mm. Maybe it is a mechanic you can avoid, mm. right? You can just kill the robots, then kill the boss and then go. And I can, if I think back to some of our dream team style, mm. like parties we've had, like I can think if we were, you know, back in the day on oh, the trap, the coral, the snowflake, the the meteor. I even on plus two, I think we shit this in, right? Like it just goes straight because the amount of like that party makeup, right? Had everything we needed. It, it didn't have a lot of heals, but it had a lot of sustain and it had a lot of like the, the amazing and the pure damage that was there and the tankiness from the crap. Like we had a really strong party. And I feel like in that case, we wouldn't, we would just go, let's just kill everything. 
Yeah. Right. My, I'll, be, I'll, I'll probably just, just on yeah. that with the most recent party we had with Kelp, Blinkblade, and Shards and Astral. That also could have been pretty catastrophic, especially if we could set you up. Because you've got the two guys just going ham. There yeah. are so many things for you to chain off your thing to then put the pure damage on, and then we just do the brutal, brutal again, right? That's, yeah, that's a really good point as well. Yeah, with that, because, yeah, just e- even without brittle, being able to do a big hit on one thing and then, like, even pushing five damage onto the boss, right, is massive because that's essentially an attack 10. Like with the half damage thing, so but 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 it's not an attack though. No, no, that's what I mean though. Oh, like yeah, if, yeah, yeah, like bouncing. Like if I can, you can do seven damage, which was not unachievable without brittle on a normal monster that bumps five damage onto the boss, which yeah. is not an attack because it's damage, and and a five damage on the boss is equivalent to an attack ten. Yeah, because you're halving. So it's um yeah, you're right. Yeah, even that party would would be the interesting thing. Is, this is probably one of the bosses that maybe the kelp doesn't. Do super well against, although it doesn't have shields or retaliate. So, mm. um, this attack damage, ones right? aren't good, but most of the time, because they're attacking with advantage, it goes to attack two. So, those become like well, especially at least chipping away. Yeah, yeah, true, true, true. So, yeah, you're right. Like with the previous party, we probably also. So, this is a really interesting party to try and work this out on. Mm, I'm looking forward to the puzzle of working out how we can be better. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the only thing I think I'd say about maybe, and I'll, I'll have more to say about this next week once we either pass it or fail it again and then just say, no, fuck it, we're not doing it. Good yeah. luck. Uh, I'm sure the next scenario is shit anyway. Um, uh, is uh, are the pressure plates in the right positions on the map to encourage people to want to utilize them? And I, I ask that because, um, again, on the on the way that the map's designed, the real machines are tricky to use. And again, I, I want another go at this to confirm. This is just like a more of a hypothesis of like, is this? And I'm not sure because I have to we we'll have to play around with it. It seems like the ruin machine one is the closest. Um, but those are the ones that are gonna die the quickest and also are gonna be the most in your face. So the most you would get out of it is maybe making the boss jump to one of those, right? Because the special two ignores it anyway. So it's not gonna help in melee. The bolt shooters, again, are almost too far away to really ha- be an issue. And because they do multi-target, grabbing it s- stops them from attacking you, but they're just going to pick three other targets or four other targets. And one of them might be the boss, so you might get one or two damage in. And then you've got the blade spinners and the automatons are like the other side of the map, which mm. you really need to commit to to go. And if somebody's spending even two turns to move over there, I wonder how much that helps you. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. I I, I don't know, honestly. I, I, I hope the mechanic makes sense. Um, but I know from some of the feedback you said from a community perspective, and I'm sure you're going to go into this in a minute, um, there does seem an element of like, oh, we can just skip it. Mm. Which would bum me out a little bit. Um, but... Yeah, well, so do you want to go into the kind of some of what the community has been saying, or do you want to cover that next week when we have another crack at it uh let's do that next week actually i've got it here but we'll we'll cover it next week actually it's good good point i will mention one member member of the community who's got some feedback on this and that's mark um so his thoughts are the writing a plus immersion a plus mechanic design in theory a plus but in practice it was a bit clunky and hard to embrace i am keen to give it another go though um and yeah that that would probably come down to um the app situation yep. Um, yep. that he's talking about. Uh, what about another member of the community who we haven't seen for a very long time? How are they going? Phil? No. Uh, another member of the community we haven't seen in I a haven't while. seen in a very, very, very long time. Hopefully he does come back at some stage. Weedy? Or me. Ah, uh, or me. Okay. Um, nah, he's booked hard in this one. It doesn't matter Super where hard. he goes, he's going to get this shit kicked out of him, right? Like, if he goes forward, the monster's going to kill him. If he stays back, the robot, the boss is going to kill him. He's done. Yep. No, he's no, absolute toast. This is probably one of the worst Ormi scenarios I, in the whole game. Like, I, I, I'm usually optimistic with Ormi scenarios. You're like, nah, no chance. I'm like, oh, well, maybe if you try this. Like, there is zero chance that he has any... He'll die in the first two rounds. Like... We need to outside do of, outside of really, really lucky RNG. He's absolutely. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we 
<laughs> we need to do a tier list of just the worst orbing scenarios. And then yeah. which one does he die in turn one? Like yep. round one, <laughs> the most dangerous versus ones where it's like, no, 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 he can probably survive three rounds. Uh, that'll be really fun. You know how um you know how with like roguelike games and stuff like that you have your mutators or they call them different things in different games where you just make you do the same game again but you make it harder because you have different things. I almost feel like there's a Ormi mutator, right? Where like you play the game with Ormi and the condition is I don't know, there's some massive negative that if you if he dies, it could just be that you lose, right? Or it could also be like you just I don't know, get some massive negative that's not good. But it would be fun if this wasn't such a long game, it's going to take us two years to complete the campaign to replay the game with Ormi in every single scenario. Mm. And just because it, because that one scenario we did, and we probably got a pretty good one for him, but it may even change the way we did that. Yeah. Right. Like everything was about get in front of him, stop him, move these things around, like block and make sure that they weren't going for him. And I feel like that would be really cool as an optional thing to be able to put into a scenario for you to go like, yeah, yeah, let's try and do it. Yeah. You know, and even if it was just per scenario, like you, you set it all up, you read the rules and go, oh, do we want to, do we want to add this in? It's like, if the escort survives, you get a really cool reward. But if they die, right, then you lose all your XP rewards or something like that. Yeah. Brutal. Love it. And if, he, if, he, if he succeeds, you get a morale. Yeah, that's it. I mean, we can really push hard for that, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, anyway. It's just no, that I, 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 I love it. I think that um, eventually the people who do Crimson Scales, if they ever get back to doing any more stuff, can just have a game called Ormi. Ormi. And it's literally just scenarios with Ormis in it, and you just got to keep Ormi alive. Kind of like Lemmings, but, like, I don't know, the reverse. Um, it's just which one is of Ormi. <laughs> Yeah, but then it could become a mainstream thing where the next minute you've got, like, Ormi's been um, incorporated or... Uh, uh, put into Twilight Imperium, right? And now you've just got a random army floating through space that you've got to avoid. But if you manage to find him, he becomes the ally and just starts auto-attacking nearby ships. <laughs> like, yep, sounds good. Thanks, <laughs> heaps of sense. Ormi can become its own franchise. Yeah. Um, all right, so... Oh, actually, I'll cover um, DPS, actually, just quickly. So we got that there uh, to give us a snapshot. Now, we are doing most of our damage onto the boss, at least later on. So, a lot of half damage here. But, Gaz, you were on 33. I had 41. Mark on the shackle was on 50. And Phil at 56. So, yeah, there's only, what, 20 between everyone, roughly, mm -hmm. um, all together. Mm -hmm. And then damage taken was just pretty gross. Um, 31 all the way up to 43. Uh, split between all of us, so... Just super, on um, super fun. Just on damage and stuff. Like, uh, so I did continue my run uh, of drawing my miss all the time. Um, I'm not sure exactly on like uh, plus minus miss and crits that I did, but I know I did top deck it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, it has been thrown out in the community as a suggestion uh, from Lunacy that I cut my deck. Mm -hmm. um, now. My idea is that my terrible luck isn't that I shuffle my miss to the top. It's that the miss ends up on top of my deck. That's Those are two different things, right? So my understanding is that if I cut my deck, I will then be placing the miss from the middle on top, which means I shouldn't cut my deck, but then it will already be on top. So I'm going to try it though. I'm going to cut my deck, yeah. right? And I'm going to see if that makes a difference. Yeah. Um, and I will report back. Yeah, okay, nice. But the good news is you didn't break your record. No, I don't think so. I think that's going to be hard to break. Um, I think it was like five. If anyone can do it, you can. Ah, uh, I believe in myself. Yeah. yeah. Everyone believes in you. I'm not amped up for a... Re F a well, what what would be really cool is if once we're going to recording mode for all future games, like, you know, with Crimson Scales and the community, if we do that one, everyone gets to see you miss. And it might fix it completely just because... Maybe. All of a sudden, yeah. everyone's watching it, and you all of a sudden, like Schrodinger's cat like type thing. Once it's observed, it doesn't exist anymore, or it yeah. changes its its form, and it gets yeah, transferred okay. to Mark instead, or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, or Phil. That'd be hilarious. Oh. Um, yeah. Look, I am really interested because I, I bet there's people listening that don't believe me. Like they're just like, ah, <laughs> uh, you know, that's just that. You know, well, I was talking about the random that's that that's happens in your head where you, you remember all the bad shit and you don't remember all the good stuff, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I I acknowledge that right? But this happens all the time. Like, it's so... At least once a scenario, my the top card on my deck is the miss. Yep. It's 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 just fascinating how and it happens. I think once in every two scenarios, it's the same for me. So it's um, not as often as Gaz, so it doesn't 
look as uh, amazing when it happens, but it it shits me up the wall as well. Yep. Yep. So yep. we are M dirt. We are M dirt. So I want to talk as inspiration from the scenario we've done about app assistant programs. Are they good? For board gaming, Kaz, do you like the idea of an app running in the background to help or assist with the game that you're playing? No. Why? I would like something to be so cleanly designed that you don't need it. Right? But, and this is the caveat, is that if they do allow you to add more complexity and more systems into the game and then it feel clean and be smooth, then I'm okay with it, right? And the example I used before we go too far in is like TI. Mm. TI works without any apps, Yep. right? When you have that tracker thing that you can put on the TV and we can access that our, on our phones, which shows like technologies and all the points and all that kind of shit, that's great because mm. it's, AI is such a big board that it's really hard to see other stuff. And I mean, it's all open information, but me saying like over the other side of the board, hey, daddy, have you researched uh, like Early light wave like yeah. or something like that? Yeah. And you're like, why? I'm like, well, I don't know. Just curious. There's a random question I had during this eight hour game. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it kind of ruins that. Like I'm trying to work it out. So it, it like, I, I, I don't like that the, a game need, if a game needs the app, right. Because I feel like in that case, then it's probably over complex in mm. a sense, and it's also. But in saying that, if it if it if it's easy to use and it makes the game better, then I'm kind of fine with that. So it's a, it's a yeah, it's a really weird balance. Yeah. Okay. Do you like what it's doing for Gloom and Frosthaven? Yeah. Look, I really do. Uh, I, I think that it makes the whole table be able to see what's going on. Um, and mm. a little bit, like, because we haven't experienced this at all in Frosthaven, and I haven't really experienced this since we played Gloomhaven forever ago, right, is that even when the monster ability cards were coming out, until we started putting them up on the screen, it was really tricky because they were over the other side of the, the table and Mark was managing that. And just not having access to that information changed, like, my experience of playing because I look at my turn and go, well, I'm going early, but I, hang on, what are they doing? What's this one doing? What's that one doing? And that just slowed everything right down. So I was kind of like, oh, okay, I'm either just going to have to not care and get surprised. Like, oh, shit, that one's doing an attack six and not moving. I wish I'd known that before I stood next to it. Yeah. Or like, I'm just going to have to keep asking, oh, what's that doing? Oh, what's that doing? Oh, what's that doing? And and both of those options seemed really shit. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's been great for giving everyone access to like all the info. Yeah. Do you remember um, Gloomhaven with the monster stat cards, how it had the square that goes into the pocket and it's, you've got the little um, fractions that you can actually place all the statuses and you can place the health and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, the apps have replaced that. Can you ever go back to playing it legitimately? Like with no. Frosthaven, yeah, with Frosthaven, they actually gave initiative trackers to make it easier for the... That, that wasn't in Gloomhaven. So oh, yeah, every, everyone's got a cardboard tracker that just says Banner Spear. It's like a like a rectangle and it says Banner Spear. So every character's got one. It's actually on your punch board. You can actually see them in, on your punch board uh, along with your standee that you never use um, of the character. But it's supposed to be that, yeah, it, it keeps all the initiative together so you can make a little ladder, like a man, uh, physical ladder. And then, of course, you've got um, the, like the things have been implemented in the game that out of the box it becomes still a little bit more streamlined. But you still have the monsters that you need to put those little tiny mm. damage counters on. And if you've ever played Gloomhaven and you've fought oozes, it's an absolute nightmare. Well, I remember you bought a whole bunch of mini um, spin down dice. Mm. So like the That's mini right. health spin. Down. Yeah. So we were using those instead because tracking the with the little counters, especially as you said. You got the things like oozes, or you have lots of um, high hit point monsters with those stacks of things. Because on the card, it had from memory, you had the stats, but then it had like um, standee like one, two, three, four, five, right? And then you would put the thing in the wedge for that monster. Yep. Because they didn't have their own boards because that would just get ridiculous. Yep. So even there, once you had multiple things that had all been hit and you had more, it was like, Things would lay well, things would kind of keep stun on them for too long or immobilize or like when was that supposed to drop off? Um, or mm. had that health there? Is that on that one or that one? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's really tricky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, you're right. Actually, now I remember we did have the spin down dice, um, not only for us, for our health and XP, but also for the monsters. So we had yeah. one on each wedge. You're right. Yep. And yep. we would just turn them down for the health. It was just, yep. if anyone knocked the table, it was just like, oh. Yeah. It, and look, and even that is a mod now, right? Like that's that's modifying the um, like kind of vanilla um, game that comes with and adding in peripherals. So I guess this is my like, while I don't like a game that requires an app to play, um, it's like going like, well, you, you can't go, it's okay to use dice and other trackers, but we can't use a digital version of that because that's bad. So I kind of, anything that makes it uh, more streamlined, I think mm. is good. Yeah. No, that's, that's some good points. Do you, will an app or a program ever convince you that rolling dice with them is better than IRL? No, not at all. I love rolling dice. It's the best. Yeah. Like okay. dice are just so fun to roll. It doesn't matter. Like the sound of them, you need well, at least three. Two or three, it has to be multiple because that's the most fun when there's a, you know, yeah. the clackety clack of them rolling across the, it's just like, it's like putting your favorite playlist of a hundred songs on and then clicking next on shuffle. You don't know what's going to come up, but you know, you know, one of the possibilities, but you don't know which one. It's exciting, right? Yeah. Okay. What are you, the Gloomhaven Secretary that we did use originally, because it was quite complex and quite deep with what it was doing, allowed you to customize your AMD, every character had their own AMD on the board, just like the enemy ones. We never used it, but there was it was implemented there so that you didn't even have to flip your own cards. You could just oh. click a button and the cards come up. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Is that still under the same guidance of the whole dice thing where even, you know, you, you want to roll dice yourself, but what about flipping a card from your deck? Nah, I wouldn't do it myself. Um, it, I, I'm fine with people doing that. Like, I, I'm not against it at all. Oh, no, um, this is more but, personal. Yeah, personal. Yeah, now, personally, I don't like RNG on... Uh, in digital, so dice or cards, which are essentially the same thing, because it always they can feels. Be it's not that they can be rigged, but if I okay, well, let's use me again for the example. I constantly draw my miss, especially when it's on top. I'm like, wow, that's crazy! How funny is this? This is wild. Let's talk about this. But I don't think that there's some problem, right? I'm not mm. like, oh man, the universe is broken, right? There's definitely Maybe. some problems. Somewhere. There's, some, there's something going <laughs> wrong. Yeah. But if this was happening digitally. Yeah. Okay. I, I, you'd totally be like, no, there's a glitch somewhere, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So this is why, um, and, and I've seen this over playing, um, uh, like miniature games, there's one called Star Wars Legion that I was playing. And for during COVID, especially, we were playing online on TTS and you'd roll dice on there. If I was ever face to face playing and somebody rolled eight dice and rolled all hits, right? Like just rolled fire. Even if it was against me, you'd be like, holy crap, that's crazy. You know, or even more dice. And you'd be like, wow. Like witnessing a roll like that is is even the fact that you just got the, the unit got deleted, you'd be like, wow, that was an experience. Online, you're like, nah, it's bullshit. Like it didn't matter. If you saw it, even if you did it, you'd be like, oh, that nah, that feels real bad. Right. And it's just that because it didn't really happen in real life that there's this disconnection and maybe it's just for me, but in this disconnection in my brain of like, I don't know, is it really random? Yeah. You know? Um, and so that's where I'd say, no, flipping a card, if I was achieving the results I'm currently getting, but digitally, I'd be calling for a, a third party or a different app, or I'd be like, nah, I'm going manual. Because this, this couldn't happen in real life. Let's be honest. If it was you flipping an, a digital AMD, you would not miss as much. Maybe. I mean, it wouldn't be me shuffling. So, I mean, <laughs> this is the thing. We don't know whether it's, is my bad luck through the shuffling? Is it my bad luck during the drawing? Like, if I was drawing Phil's AMD, will it be a miss all the time? Or is it if I was shuffling Phil's? Or is it just because it's my AMD? Like, it's my ownership thing. Anyway, this mm. is getting off track. I'm talking about <laughs> my, my... I actually usually have quite good luck. I would say that I'm usually, like, 60-40 when it comes to luck-based, like, dice things. But this AMD is the only thing I've I've recognized that I, uh, I you know... I have shit luck on. Yeah, look, I'm going to thaw me me then, but just do you, do you. <laughs> um, but I, no, I've only got two years of Frosthaven to base it on. I've forgotten everything else we've ever played yeah. ever. And yeah, I don't think you have the greatest luck. Examples of games that uh, use apps at the moment, 
and, and have I've only got a couple here that I have either played or I know about. Uh, Mentions of Madness, we, we actually mentioned last week, which uses an app on an iPad. And you can also get it on Steam, put it on a computer. But it actually, when you pick a scenario or a mission or whatever they, they're called in there, it randomizes elements of it so that the layout can be slightly different. And then it's got the point and click points of interest where it's kind of like, there's a question mark over here, uh, but the next time you play it, it may not be there, maybe completely a different, a different token that you can interact with. And it keeps things really fresh. The game will not work without it. Uh, the original Mansions of Madness that came out was a 4v1 or a multiple against one. And one person played as, I guess, the mansion and, and the monsters and all of that. Whereas now it's completely automated so that it's more of a cooperative game. But the game is designed purely with the app in mind. And I think, I believe the app is free and it works perfectly fine. It's from FFG and they've done a really bang up job of it. But that that is an instance where I'm completely fine with it because you're buying into a game that needs the app. You know this before you've even purchased it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Lords of the Rings Journey in Middle Earth is exactly from FFG as well. It's just, I, I haven't played it, but it looks like Mansions of Madness with Lord of the Rings. Because uh, it cool. worked. It worked for Mansions of Madness. So it was almost like, hey, if we get a really good IP, we can probably make more money. Yeah. Um, and I hear that they like that. That's good on them. Good on them. Uh, Beyond Humanity. We played this at Game Mania um, last year. And yeah. that was the one with uh, Colonies, which has a really, don't get me wrong, really cool app integration that tracks so many really, really cool things, population, and as you're building up this space colony to survive and interacting with each other and it's semi-co-op and all that kind of stuff. And... Um, you need the app. You absolutely need the app because the whole bloody board and all the miniatures and structures and all that, they light up and they glow green when they're going mm. well and they glow red when there's problems. And visually, it looks amazing, the whole thing that. And it kind of fell apart a little bit due to probably the app, which had a bunch of issues. I think Phil was saying that he he uh, there was an update that fixed a bunch of stuff. And there was also some... Because um, one of the problems with having an app-based thing, and we've we ran into this really early with Xhaven was like, when there's a mistake made, how do we go back? Right now, Xhaven has the, just the undo, which just literally just reverts the things that happen, which is, which is good. And once we learned that, how that worked, it was fine. But I remember on uh, Beyond Humanity, it was early on. It's like, if you click the wrong thing and I can't even remember the game now, but it was like, how do I undo that? Like, where's the go in and manually change what happened so that it's right. And, I think we eventually found something like that, but it was like halfway into the game that it happened. So yeah, it, it, it creates a problem when it's digital because you can't just fix a problem, mm. you know? Um, and that's the uh, kind of where you run into like Gloomhaven digital versus say real life. If you accidentally click the wrong thing in Gloomhaven digital, there's no undo, mm. right? You can restart. Yeah, you can restart the turn, I believe. Like you can go restart round and it goes back to the start of the round and because it has kind of, already worked out the RNG in some capacity, the same things happen. So you can't use that to cheese it in a way. Yeah. But um, but most games don't have that. Most things don't have a, uh, you click the wrong thing or you've done the wrong thing here, let's just go back a step. And so that can kind of create a little bit of a like, oh, that sucks because that was a misclick or I didn't read that properly. Whereas it, in real life, you don't have that issue as much. No. Like you can fix it if you need to. I guess one of the other problems you're going to run into is, um, what do they call it? App assistance or where they maintain it. So if you have to maintain these things because obviously technology keeps advancing forwards and new devices and people are getting new tablets and all that, and it has to be fed. But if you've released the game forever ago, let's just say Mansions of Madness is an example. Let's say we're 15 years from down the line, they haven't released a new one. They still have to keep that app running for people who have that game. Mm. Uh, if for any reason they decide, you know what, we'll just subtly stop adding to it and stop doing anything with it and all of a sudden it's busted you you just made this game pretty much obsolete for anyone who doesn't have an older version of the app yeah yeah it's a really good point because like with a pure board game right like if you're just looking at with no digital components if there's a thing that needs a routering it's it's easy for them to be like randomly put out in a router of like hey this should be this because it's more balanced or they don't need to and the community can do it Right, because there's heaps of examples of that. Games that go like well beyond their support, and then a uh, community is created. Like, oh, here's how you rebalance these factions or these rules or whatever. Um, if the game relies on the app to play, you can't do that, no. right? Like, if it's a if it's in a companion app like we're using in Xhaven, then it's fine because it's only there to represent whatever's on the game, so it doesn't matter. You can change the rules, but if it's something that drives the game 
and there's a problem, mm. a bug, an issue, a balance issue, then you're right, you're just stuck with it. Like you go, we have to play this game yeah. in this broken version um, and there's no way of getting past it unless you know how to edit apps and then I think that also creates a whole bunch of other issues. So, you know, yeah, it, it does create a bit of a weird situation and I suppose it brings in, and not to go down this rabbit hole, but it brings <laughs> in the challenges that digital games like just video games face these days when it comes to support yeah you know game comes out especially if it's a multiplayer game and they need servers and they need support and then company gets past that game and then people still want to play it and then the game is just dead yeah maintenance right mode. yeah exactly and it doesn't get updates it doesn't work properly there's an issue and it never gets solved um it's really interesting and Funnily enough, and this is one of those examples that I was very surprised, uh, you know, Supergiant Games, the ones that do like Hades and they do a whole bunch of other games. Yeah. So they made, um, they've made a whole bunch of, I love that company that everything they make has just been great. And um, they are making releasing Hades 2 and that made me want to go back and play Hades 1. And um, there's a, they do cross platform progression. So like if you've got it on PC and say on Switch, you can keep your save file between the two, which is amazing because it's really cool. I played it on Switch. I didn't want to play it on Switch anymore. I want to play it on my PC. And so I was like, great, I'll do that. There was an issue with the uh, syncing of Steam on the Nintendo uh, Switch and it just wasn't working. And I was like, why is this not working? Like, And I went in and people were like, yeah, here's how you do it. And it just wasn't. And so I posted a Reddit thing on the Nintendo forum and also on the Hades forum. Like, ah, and heaps of people were like, oh yeah, I just tried that. It's not working. I was like, this is going to go into develop. This is just like going to be never fixed, right? They actually did it. They fixed it. Like someone jumped on. It was like, hey, cool. We saw the problem. And yeah, we've gone through. It was a problem with like the Nintendo store and how they updated this, that, and the other and blah, blah, blah. We fixed all that. And I was so impressed because they're working on Hades 2 and I'm asking for a fix for how to sync by save file on Hades 1. Yeah. Like that's the level of support that you want from a company. But that's, that's awesome. so rare. Yeah. Like, that's what I mean. From a digital world, that's super. I, I was when they replied and fixed it. I was like, oh my God. And everyone else was like, because it actually got quite a lot of um, people saying, yeah, yeah, me too. And it was like, wow, they actually did it. I just don't think you get that level of support. And that's that's the problems that you inherit when you start bringing digital stuff into uh, requiring, yeah, right, uh, as, as a component of the board game. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the times also when you're a board game developer, you're not thinking, you're not a technology person. You've got to hire that, right? So, and and board game in the board game space, you're not making the potential millions and billions of dollars that the video game companies are making because of the reach, right? So, yeah, I can sort of see That's where support can well. become really expensive. Uh, two yeah. more examples I've got here that we won't necessarily go into. Dune Imperium, which is the deck building game set in Dune. There's actually an app that you can actually... Because you can play that with two people. And when you play with less than a certain amount of people, there's like an automated thing that you need to do to keep the balance. Um, there's an app now that you can actually have that runs that separately and actually does different things with it, which I haven't looked into. It just sounds really cool. It just sounds oh. like something... It allows you to also play the game solo. Because we've, uh, we've played that, yeah? Uh, you and I played it once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. But like, so... Did we do the thing that the app does? Well, it was such a long time ago. I barely played the game. I can't remember what was automating in the background to keep things balanced for two people. But apparently, yeah, the app sort of fixes it at lower play accounts to make it better. But also it spices things up a little bit. Uh, spices things up a little bit. I see what you did there. Yeah, Good job. I just, just stuffed I that it. in there by a complete accident. Uh, finally, there's Alchemist. Alchemist is probably one of the most famous ones where it's a game that relies on the app and you're all a bunch of alchemists making potions and there's deduction and all sorts of stuff. And apparently, like, the app makes the game amazing. Well, it, you need to play it, but it integrates so well that it just feels like it was meant to be, you know, all along. It's a pretty I've old game, actually. It's about... Never played that before. I, never no, even I, don't, even, I don't even have it. Um, oh, really? Funnily enough, yeah. So, I guess I'll get that and I'll try Yeah, to... probably should. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, lastly, as a bonus question that I'm going to throw you on the spot here, you can wish for any program or any app or any device for the Haven series. What do you want? I'll go just to help uh, while you're thinking on that, right? You can, you can have whatever you want. So I kind of wanted, right now there's an app, um, there's a website that I mentioned in my Welcome to Frost Haven video. It's called uh, Gloomhaven Monster Mover. And it, you know, you can build a map and you can move the monsters, right, where you are to check the line of sight or check mm. where the focus is or all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't really um, kind of mind if they implemented it in such a way 
that the 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 number one you can seed um, a map yourself so someone can create it, but no one's really done it. But someone who can make every single scenario in that program or make a program that has the layout of everything, almost like a digital gloomhaven kind of thing, just very rough. Um, that helps with focus and monster movement, but while you're playing it. So 97, for example, you load it up and there it is. It's already good to go. It's already got all the monsters there. And as you move one in the location, you can also move the monster on the map so that you've always got the positioning mirrored to what's happening on the thing, if that makes any sense. So that when something activates and it's their turn, hell, you can tie in an integration with Xhaven so they can talk to each other. So when the app goes, it's like, cool, oh, Ruin Machine, Elite, number three, this one over here, it's going to move over here and hit this guy instead of us doing it. Look, yeah. it's laziness, but yeah. at the same time, I think it'd be great because we would never mess that up. That's true. That's true. If the game played itself, we would definitely make less mistakes. Yeah, or, or something like, okay, I have 90 gold, I'm playing a Geminate right now and I don't have a hand item. You know, well, give me like three that I could use. And they'll be like, oh, here you go. And here's how to make them. Here's the recipes you needed. Boom. I don't yeah. Know, something like that. Um, What's missing, know, guys? What's I missing? I can't really think of anything. Like maybe a digital, like, sorry, uh, an, uh, an app version of the FAQ. Um, you know, that'd be good. <laughs> uh, so I know that someone's working on that. But um, I, I can't think of anything because I think the again without getting too far into needing an app to play it which is kind of this we're on the edge of that um i think it's got enough so yeah i i I can't think of it. If I think of anything, I'll let you know next week. Yeah, okay. More, maybe, maybe more sound effects. Maybe Exhaven um, person. Um, I forgot the name. Um, in, introduce, like, when it goes to Rule Machine, it plays, like, a, a, you know how Pokemon, when they come on the screen, they have their unique they noise? They say their name. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah the noise. Yeah, yeah. The noise. Okay. Um, they can have a noise, so it's like, oh, cool. And then when certain cards, like, self-destruct come up, it plays, like, an epic legendary noise or something. So yeah. like, we all get scared. Um, yeah, that could be cool. Not yeah, enough sound. I I think the, the the last kind of thought on that of what what could I can't think of anything could get created, but I think That's the fine. the game works really well without all of that stuff, and I think that that's been designed um, in a way that it's, p- it's completely playable, right? Like it's not even we would struggle to go back because we've gone to this space, but when we played Gloomhaven. I don't ever remember going like, man, this is such a chore that I don't want to do it. I'd rather that there was like a digital version of all this. Like, I, mm. I, yeah, it, so I think that Xhaven or Secretary or whatever, which one you use, plus um, uh, Fortella with the reading of the stuff are like really cool add-ons that make it easier to play. Um, but I definitely think that the game is probably at the maximum amount of complexity you want for like a components piece and like fiddliness. Yeah. Um, it still works. Yeah, um, okay. It just means you need to change your setup. Like if we were to play with the physical components, we would have to change how we, where we put everything because yeah. you'd need to have the cards in a way that people could see. Yeah, okay. You probably don't need to have the health of all the monsters so everyone can see because you can ask and that's not too much of a problem, but you definitely would need to centralize the monster cards um so that people would be able to just have a glance and see what was going to happen mm. um but yeah yeah i think it's uh what um i have a new thing that i want i want when you open up like gloomhaven 2.0 and you've got your little tuck box with your mini in it there's a, and you got your tuck box with all your cards and all that there's a third tuck box and it's a bit bigger and it's a costume of the character so that you can wear it at the table tell me right now you don't want this <laughs> So just like, I don't know, a giant coral, like giant crab outfit. And every time it's a session, you're like, cool, I'm the crab. And look, it doesn't have to be good quality or it can be a hat, but I'd rather a full costume. And you can just sit there and you've got your arms and then you've got the side ones coming out for, you know, because you're a crab. So you've got other arms and other legs. Um, and it allows you to really role play into the character. I think just, I think that'll be worth it. All right. So what I'm hearing now is that for 2.0, we yeah. know all the characters because they're all Gloomhaven characters. I don't like where you're going with this. What we need to do (laughs) is we need to design some form of attire. Now, I don't think costumes, costumes will be too bulky, but at least some kind of hat or headband or something (laughs) that we wear. So when we're recording, people don't need to ask what characters are you playing? They can be like, ah, that guy's on the Mind Thief because he's wearing the Mind Thief hat. Oh, that's actually pretty cool. Don't give me more things to do. Okay, I'll do it. Um, oh, well, let, let's think about how that would work. And if anyone has any suggestions on a way that we could do that that would be easy to represent and see, not just 
yeah, something that would work. Like, uh, come at us with ideas and we'll work through it. Yeah. Uh, note to self, pick humans and um, just normal looking human characters. I think there's way more humans in this one. Probably. Wait, well, there's at least one. one. What, in Gloomhaven 2.0. Oh, no, yeah. 2.0. Yeah. Frosthaven has at least one. At least one. I, I, I can only think of one in, um, in Gloomhaven, but I'm sure there's a second one. Isn't the sun? Or is that? No, that's not. That's a Valorant. Nah. No, no, nah, they're the Sawbones. Oh, this no is human. what that is. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Cool. So. All right, we'll finish off with our items. Let's nail through our items. We've got the big two-handers here. Quick observation that I saw. There aren't that many two-handed items. Nowhere Less. near compared to one. Yeah. Our hit and shit list. Yeah. Hit and shit list. All right. Uh, two-handed world of Smishy Smashy. What do you want to do? Uh, yeah. I'll, yeah, I want to do that. Do you want me to start? No, I'm so, I was asking, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go first. I'll go first. Uh, yeah. So, um, let me just if, quickly... If you say one of mine, I'm not going to... I don't have a backup. Um, well, I'm just going to jump on your bandwagon. No worries. Uh, so, on good list. Uh, so, honorable mention, because I won't go into it because it's actually a bit of a meme, is the Abyss Axe. Um, oh, this God. is the goat weapon, okay? This is the best of the two-handed weapons, okay, out of everything... If you are fighting, frozen corpses are three or living tombs. <laughs> like three attack and pierce one is amazing, right? Can That's I, can incredible. I just, can I just say something about that item? Yeah. Uh, I think Dwarf mentioned that recently. I saw it somewhere because people are upset about that. It just says attacks. It's not mm. melee attacks. Oh, you can do range as well. Yeah. yeah well, which makes sense because it's part of that stupid, the oh, worst. Yeah thing in the world yeah um so that's not one of mine i just wanted to say like if that wasn't if that didn't have that restriction on it it would be the best item it'd be busted yeah absolutely um or if you make this and then you just keep it for any scenario that have them in then you're also going to be <sighs> incredible right so anyway, imagine during your attack ability at that that would work for like the crab right like the stabby crab because it's attack ability yeah Oh, it says to one attack. Yeah, one okay, attack. Cool. Oh, they fix yeah, okay, cool. Oh, um, yeah, calm down. Yeah, I know. Uh, all right, cool, cool. So my actual first one uh -huh. is the crude spear, um, kind of oh. slash the long spear, because they're almost the same thing. Sure. Um, so uh, uh, this is item number eight is the crude spear, and the long spear is uh, 153. So the crude spear reads, uh, during your turn, one of your single target melee attack abilities may target an enemy two hexes away. Mm -hmm. Um the only difference with the long spear is it turns your single target into like a two thing. So it's like one, two. Mm -hmm. So they're basically the same, except that I can see in a world that you, with the crude spear, you could attack a hex that wasn't adjacent to you or in a line. So mm. I think like you know, in a, on a diagonal, because that would be two away. So that's the only difference between those two. Yeah. Um, I haven't used either of these, but I can see this being one of those items that just is a kind of a clutch save the day once every few scenarios um, that would be useful, right? Um, on certain characters, not so much to do like, oh, I'm going to do an attack four and something two hexes away, but it's more when you've got a status effect, like a stun or an immobilize or, some, or a push, right? Something where ha uh, I'm just out of reach. Yep. Um, but if I could get to him and then you're like, aha, I've got this item that lets me do this thing and it's not all that useful all the time, but now it's going to be really good. Yeah, there, there are times though when you are setting up next to something, you've spent the last turn, you've gone late, you've walked up to something and you're next to it and you're ready to pop it, right? With a bottom ability on the following turn, that's going to be like plus one to all your attacks or plus some kind of modifier. So you don't plan to move next time, but the thing you're next to is ranged and he happens to go before you, moves back one and then does that. It doesn't mess your turn up because, you know what I mean? It's those situations where yeah. the range target's moved away. This means you don't have to use the bottom to now move and get back into position. You can still do what you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so fairly niche. And the only other thing with that, and this is going to be a theme through most of the items that I say through all of this. So just mm. imagine this is the tagline. It would be great if this was a one-handed item. That's fair. That's fair. It'd be interesting to have a chat about what makes, you know, one hand versus two hand and makes it qualify. Because what deserves two hand status, you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway. Oh, I love it. Uh, I'm going to start off with item 144. This is the Staff of Eminence. 
Do you have oh, this on your yeah, list? Oh, yeah. I, I had this on my list because it's fucking broken, but <laughs> I, I took it off to talk about interesting things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I'll, I'll, I'll cover the broken. So, obviously, very, very broken. It's a minor power pot every rest cycle. <laughs> so, <laughs> why wouldn't you? Um, I actually considered taking this on my Meteor, um, but didn't, which because of the two, the two-hander thing was a bit rough, mm. but I still think even as a two-hander, it's still bloody good, mm-hmm. especially on some characters who multi-attack. Um, you just need to make sure the elements are, which is something that our current party seems to struggle with a little bit, which is, um, we'll have to wait and see how that goes until I can learn how to punch myself. <laughs> but yeah. Um- yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm glad that Mark didn't fully steer into the brokenness on the um, stabby crab and take that as well. Yeah. Um, that was like one of the only things that he didn't have because um, yeah. it just makes it even sillier. So yeah, no, I love it. I love. I just it's so good. It's so strong and that tap. And none of us have used it. No, uh, but damn, it looks good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, what's next? Uh, the translocation rod. So one eighty one. Translocation. I have that as well. Did you? Yes. So this is like the um, uh, magnetic cloak. Like it's just I can. Uh, it, it. Reading give me, it. Give, give me. Give me one second. All right. I will do my bit because you're going to help me with it. Okay. This seems really, really, really cool. I haven't worked out how to break the game with it, sure, because I can't mentally think about what it can be used with. But I'm sure you could do some amazingly super tricky things with that. What might they be, guys? Oh, no, no, I, I, no, no, I haven't come up with any, like, really busted things. Oh, okay. it's, it's more, it's just a cool um, item. no, like, the, like, like the magnetic cloak to, um, solve, uh, Move scenario more. puzzles, right? Yeah. So there's, this we, we found with the magnetic cloak, which for those that don't know, it's like the one that you can teleport 20 as long as you, uh, end next to an ally. Yeah. Um, and I had that as a, I got it as a random item early on in my shards play. And basically every scenario I found, if it wasn't a good use for it, it was a, this wins a scenario for us, right? Like it was a really clutch play. And just being able to switch, because uh, it's turn doesn't have any two allies. Yeah, so it's any two allies, mm. right? Or two normal elite monsters or, or elite monsters. Like that's just there's so much utility with that and it's I, I feel like it's one of those things that's always going to be in play and even when it's not great it's going to be useful yeah. um and then sometimes it's going to be like just completely like that's insane what i what i've just actually thought about those situations there, a lot of characters a lot of squishy characters maybe assassins and and, and a, a lot of uh those type of characters They've got cards that uh, do like an attack and put a status on everything that's adjacent, but they never want to be in a position where everything's adjacent due to whatever reason. This is where I can start to see you could swap out, you could go in, do this, and then get that person swapped out with the tank or whoever (laughs) also wants to be in that exact spot. Um, And it it allows them to finally be in a position to get off the, oh my God, I could hit all adjacent. I'm I'm surrounded by five things. This is perfect. Uh, But also now I'm in trouble. Oh, look. Don't worry, I'm got retaliate up. You can plan for that. You could you can yep. really plan some really interesting turns with that. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly it. And I think that there's uh, if I think about when one of our kind of party combinations that we did have, like if you were to look at like say a blink blade or um, uh, say the media maybe or the, not as much uh, or even the stabby crab. And when we had some of our tanky characters like the Coral or the Banner Spear or some of those, like even the Astral, there is a world where like, you know, Phil gets himself into trouble all the time because he runs really far forward, does a whole bunch of damage and is like, oh, okay. But he goes really quick. Yeah. There's a world where he does that. You go quick as a tank and then on you, you carry this. Right. And then on your turn, you just switch. So not only do you get him out of trouble. I don't know if you can swap yourself. I think it's two allies. Oh. Oh, Okay. Yeah, you, the, one of your support friends. You need to coordinate with this with three people. Uh, okay, cool. That's never going to happen. Then. <laughs> no. Um, so, yeah. Okay, cool. But yeah, I get that, it. That, that fix it. But, yeah, that kind of thing where you have one person goes really forward and then you switch them with the tank. And like, just like you said, yeah, I can see it being really cool. So, yeah. Anyway, that was my, uh, my next one. Well, that was also your next one. It was. Uh, but Venge Swap is very good. Yes. Yes. Uh, should I go on to my last one then? Uh, sure. Okay, cool. Um, so the last one is the giant piranha pig spine. Oh, I did see that. So this yeah, is okay. number 202, I think. Yep. Um, so the reason I put this here, and it's going to be interesting because there's something very similar in my shit list. Um, this is the kind of like utility item I really like. 
okay? It's, two pierce is almost always useful. I find that more often than not, something in every scenario has shields, okay? Yeah. And, and maybe eventually that stuff dies and you don't need the pierce anymore, but at least then it's still doing wound. Mm. So it's an item that never is not useful unless you're fighting stuff that doesn't have shields and is immune to wound. Like, okay, cool. We can't be the best ever all the time. It doesn't do too much. Like, it's not a, oh, breaks the game, you have to have this. It's not core to anyone's build. But, I mean, we, we talk all the time and we've kind of waxed and waned on this idea of that sometimes we don't care about things with shields because we just pure damage or pierce our way through. And then we've had party compositions where we're like, oh my God, three shields may as well be a million, right? Like, because we will never get through that. Um, and this is something that I feel like fits in, obviously, for the parties that want the, in that latter category that are going to struggle with pierce. But again, it chucks the wound on there. And... I like the idea as well is that you're attacking something with high shields. You pierce through the shields, you do a bit of damage, but then you chuck a wound on and you kind of want to wound the things that have high shields because yeah. you don't need to worry so much about, you know, it, so it's, it kind of, it synergizes with itself in a way. Mm. Like it's got really deliberate targets. Um, and I think that it's a, um, yeah, it's a really cool item. I kind of wish it was one hander. Is it worth two hands? Look, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Outside of the translocation rod, I don't think that any. Sorry, not the translocation rod. The um, uh, rod of eminence, staff of yeah. eminence. I don't think any of these items are deserving of two hands in a way, because they all seem to be kind of cool. But the opportunity cost you lose from taking them is massive. There's I think so some, many good one-handers. Yeah, no, I, I see what you mean. I think there's a case for saying that there are some that are. Like, one that I'm not mentioning, uh, it's the Volatile Bomb, which is the one that turns a single target att range attack into uh, a triangle, mm. which is pretty busted for two, like, as a two-handed thing. It, it definitely relies on being able to line it up properly, mm. but I think that's worthy of a two-handed thing, whereas the one that you're mentioning right now, I'm like, I'm with you. I think it's really cool. I think it's, it's so useful. Um, I just feel like it's not worthy of the two-handed thing. Uh, yeah. It is tappable, so that means it does come back, uh, but... Then we look back at all of the cool one-handers we've got, and it's kind of like, oh, we could take two of those. That's, That's it. Yeah. No, so, cool. yeah. But anyway, I think it's I think it's really good. And, yeah, I look, I would potentially take this on a character if there wasn't any one-handers that were must-have. Like, if I didn't have a character that was like, i got to have that item because it's going to be really key to how I'm playing, um, yeah. this is something that you go, that you take it for the utility. Yeah, provided that you have melee attacks. And it's not, like... Your bar is not zero. Yes. Like one of my characters that I played. <laughs> um, the one I have, lastly, is very quick, really quick and dirty. Item 126, which is the weighted net. Uh, very, very endlessly useful. Something that comes back uh, every rest cycle, long rest cycle, I should say. But it's it's an immobilize. It's really basic, but it's also a heal. Like it, you're preventing something from being involved in a fight, especially if it's a milia, if it's a, a rending drake or something like that. This could be incredibly important to keep something locked down. The only issue I had with it when I did use it was that every time I only bought this on one character ever, and that was the snowflake. And snowflake has AMD cards that add immobilize. So there were times that I was double immobilizing things, and it was that was the only thing. Every time I played this, it was like you realize the next card is going to be immobilized. Um, but that's not even a problem with the actual car uh, the card. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I was actually going to say that I remember the only issue with this one was that you would always draw and immobilize whenever you used it, which is not really the item's fault, right? So <sighs> No, no, definitely not. But no, it's a real quick, easy one. You can get it very, very early on in your campaign. It's 20 bucks. Go out there and grab yourself a weighted net. I think so. Yeah, no, it is, it is quite good. Um, all right, so on to the shit, shit list. list. All right, so item uh, number 182, the wing clippers. Oh, okay. really? Yep. Uh, now, it's a really cool ability to be able to take flying away from something. Yeah. Yep. It's a really big investment to use both of your hand slots for a really niche like kind of ability that only really impacts a couple of characters. Like making something walk, okay, is cool because you can maze it. But most of the time you don't care. Like most characters don't care that things are flying. Mm. Um, and so like, I guess this is one of those ones that land in on for like the trap. It's really cool. And I know the trap has a card that does this as well. So you have a couple of ways of doing that so that you're not kind of um, really restricted or like, 
by flying monsters. You can make sure that they they can kind of go through your traps. And I'm sure that there's a world which things like Meteor and Snowflake, it works well too. But it's really niche and it's like to both of your hand slots. Like, okay, again, th- this fits into that category of I'd love to see a utility item slot, okay. which we talked about last week. You're right, because removing flying from something isn't necessarily something busted where someone's like, oh, you can remove flying. Oh, wow, well, clearly you're OP now. Yeah, no, these are really good points. I didn't have it on either list. Uh, I definitely saw it and I considered it. Um, I, If anything, I was going to consider shortlisting it to the, oh, this is a cool item. Um, but at the same time, okay, let me just say this. Right now it's all melee attack. Uh, sorry, after your melee attack, right? Now it's any attack. Does that make it better? Yeah, it makes it better, but it's still... Are you don't... taking it? Or is it no, out of your ship list? Not okay, a cool. chance. It's like, 20 bucks. Think about... Well, think about your your range characters, right? Yeah. Like Snowflake, Meteor. Um, I, I'll put shards into that because I played that. Um, maybe Shackles. Are you taking on any of those four? Over uh, other one, other other hand items that you need to take. That that's always the hardest part. The hardest part. Yeah, you're that's right. what I mean. Like, so yeah. with with these items, that's why I kind of the caveat of like I would love this to be a one hander is there because um, it's the. Uh, opportunity cost mm. right this is a cool ability to have but it's not worth the the like loss of all of your other abilities no, like, or all the other items point. so yeah no it's, it's a really 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 good point um and uh i like that it exists i don't think anyone's bought it no i mean i'm sure someone's going to come at me and tell me like with the robes <laughs> of doom that i'm wrong and this is the best item and it's op on something and they do Whoa. a combo of like ten thousand damage and that's fine i believe you <laughs> that this has a good niche usage i'm just saying it's on my shit list because it's mostly useless to everybody and no one wants to take it yeah we need a printed version of your shit list just out for everyone to see <laughs> just for the future of everything we ever do ever i've got i've got all my documents saved so i can put that together nice uh, my first one, and surprisingly, yes, we didn't clash yet. Are we, are we gonna, are we gonna do that this time? I have item 207, the fish hook. Uh, no, but I did consider it cause it's shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, for starters, have you seen a fish hook before? Yeah. Do you hold it with two hands? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this must be a really big one. It's huge. Uh, baning dead targets. Like it's. I know that the the kelp because it had a bane build and you can lean into it. I know there was one card in there that was like you know bane something if it's lower than three health or four health or something like that. It's it's very similar to this. That I think that's on the coral. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I, I never just, took. Never. Yeah. It's after your attack if the car, target's current hit point value is three or less, give it bane. It's still gonna do its thing. It will probably die at the end of that. Yes, guarantee. Yeah, sure. If like another player hasn't killed it already, but you're still going to take the damage. It's still going to act, mm-hmm. but it's also a two hander, <laughs> but even as a one hander, it's not good. Yeah. I yeah. can't see a world with it. If it was Bane, it would be too strong. If it was just Bane, Bane something, it's too strong. It just doesn't feel right. With yeah, the they- exception of maybe the card that Mark had, there was a persistent that uh, he played that was part of his thing where it, the next main you do stuns the target, you know, and that if you're adding something like that onto it, maybe. Yeah, well, that, that's what I was going to say. Like with the drill, I've got a, a, a like a normal attack that does stun, right? Um, and and if this, if the threshold mm. for this was higher, if the threshold for this was like five, maybe, mm. I could see a world where you're going, okay, cool. I got to hit them and get them down to five and then I can tap this. Um, and then I can kill them because it's done. And it's kind of using your two-handed slot. It's also using a part of your character and you need to build around it. And can, I can see that being like kind of fun, very niche, but fun. It, I don't know if it puts it on the good list. Um, but three, th- and that's the same reason I never took that card on on Coral, was that it's just too close to death and they still get a turn. Yeah, it's so it's three health or less. And I'm just looking at a couple of examples of level three monsters that this could be really good on. Like we're talking living spirit, elite living spirit, because they've got three shield. They've got four health. Mm-hmm. Items sometimes, and it's got me thinking of another topic in the future about scaling. Do you think this item should scale based on difficulty? Because the minute you start ramping up the difficulty, this becomes even more and more useless as an item because the health goes up of everything you're fighting. Whereas if we, if this scale, and it was like, you know, I mean, it's very hard to get your head around um, 
scaling every single item and having a little graph underneath, you know, the text and saying, if you're doing it scenario plus two, um, the threshold is now five. Uh, I get what you're saying. I don't know. Like, yes, I, I think it would be cool to have some kind of scaling. I don't know if the scaling matters though, because they will always be down to three hit points or less. They will always be down. What do you like, mean? It, it, like even though they have, I'm thinking about this in a weird way, but even though the HP goes up the higher the difficulty, they still have to go down to zero. So they will always get through that threshold. Mm. So it's like, you might need to chip away at them longer to get them to the three. Um, but you're right for things like the spirits that have really high shields for using it to get through high shielded targets. Yes. I see what you're saying. Yeah. But um, yeah. for everything else, it's still, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. I agree. It's, I agree. It's shit. It's okay. shit. Super shit. It's, it's shit without changing the item drastically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which at some point then it's no longer shit because it's a different item, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone ever will ever, ever say, hey, did you bring your fish hook? To no, anyone correct. Else. Like if it was a, say, a threshold of five or less, uh, it was a one-hander um, and maybe <laughs> scaled uh and did stun sure it'd be great <laughs> yeah fish hook people um let us know come at us yeah um my next one is the wave blade which is number 201 mm. i didn't know this item existed mm. and i was not any more enlightened when i found out it did mm -hmm. uh did you choose this one as well I did. Okay, I definitely cool. did. I was going to finish up with it because I was. Uh, I just wrote, what the fuck is this? Yeah. <laughs> the only character that I can possibly see that even would remotely make any use of this item is the yeah. coral. Yeah. And the coral does not want to use both its hands once any arrest cycle to push a character, a monster, away one and immobilize it. It's because a melee character. It has like one ranged ability in its whole deck of cards. It does not want things to be not next to it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're a tank crab, you probably want a shield car item or something like that. Something that does anything else. And if you're DPS, you probably want something that does damage, right? Or you could do one of each. Who knows? Because they're one-handed. Uh, yeah. Nah, this is a giant question mark as to how useful this could be. Especially considering the reliance on the water tile. The reliance on the water tile is just... Yeah. Yeah, I just... Yeah, I, yeah, I don't get it. This almost seems like an item that was designed and then drastically changed because it was busted, right? Like, Wave Blade, uh, it does this if you're next to a uh, water tile and, I don't know, synergizes with the water tile and the, what the crab thing wants to do and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, no, nah, that's way too busted. Uh, just just pick something shit. It's easier <laughs> to just pick something shit and put it out there because then it won't be busted anymore and you don't have to think about it. I don't know. It does also doesn't make any sense for the type of item it is. Like the wave blade, like I get the push, maybe pushing and waving, but I don't know why it's immobilizing them. Like even something similar, something like push a target one hex and then create water underneath it. That would mm. be cool. Like I actually, you could consider taking that on the coral because making water is a resource that you need to generate. It would be completely useless to every other character, but you could see it being used and it wouldn't be busted at all. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, I don't know. What you're saying is, this isn't, what we're both saying is, this is an insanely niche item that even the character that can probably get the most benefit out of doesn't want. Correct. Oh, look, I, I want people to come at me from a coral perspective and tell me why we're wrong here um, and what instances it's really good. Maybe there's a coral build that does want it. I don't know. But yes. No, well, it's been a long so. time since you've played coral and I've never played coral. So look, on, on paper, this is... I'm I'm just going to go out and say that I'm glad this item exists and I'm glad it's in the game. <laughs> because we'll never pick it, but it's fun to talk about <laughs> that it actually exists. Uh, my um, last one, because yep. um, we'll jump to that, mm -hmm. is item 205. This is the harpoon. I actually really kind of like this. And then the more I think about it, the more it sort of just, I find it not very satisfying. Uh, because it's an attack two, all right? Within range three, pull two, which is obviously really cool on a lot of people. A lot of people who maybe create hazardous terrain, who want to pull things through, um, people who want to position things next to the tank, uh, yeah, it's got some uses and it's a separate instance of an attack, which is, which is kind of cool. What I'd really dislike is the two-handed thing and it's once, it's not even a spend. Mm. It's not even, it doesn't come back. If it, if it came back, 
If it came back every rest cycle, I would find it probably a little bit too much. I think it needs the two circles. I think it needs two charges and then it's gone. But that would make it feel better as a two-handed use. Because mm. I think for just a straight up, you invest 30 bucks, it, it covers both your hand slots, it does two damage with a pull three, uh, pull two, and that's it. I don't think it's worth it. I didn't actually know this existed, and I've read Harpoon, seen the push, or so the pull icon on it, and then ignored all of the other text and assumed that it was like on one of your attacks pull the thing towards and then just not read the card. Oh, I actually okay. think I actually think this is really good. Oh, okay, go. Why? I, I don't I, I don't know if it's a um if it would go on my like uh hit list. Yeah. Like I definitely I know what you're talking about. It does feel weak ish in regards to getting a couple of goes out of it would be good, but um every rest cycle seems too strong. Yes. Like I hundred percent agree with that. Yep. I feel like this is one of those things that um uh, from an action economy perspective of classes a free attack is pretty rare mm. it's like the potion that lets you do the, like the free attack or the um whatnot so i feel like there is a uh, the true hand slot is so tricky but um i, I think can the one see... use is just the hardest bit yeah the, i can the two I, hand I can... and one use oh, i almost feel like i want this on my drill like i mean if it if it like yeah if it helps obviously bring things closer so you can hit it super hard well, because the Once. thing is, I, I I find that there's characters that have uh, bottom actions that are not moves that you still want to be able to fight with, right? Mm. So, um, uh, when you're playing a uh, like on the coral as well, I could see this being useful because there's times where you want to play a tide card that's not a move and then two attacks, so you could play that and you could pull it. But yeah, I I 100 percent I, I I see what you're saying. In most cases, this is not going to be useful for people, especially because it takes two hand slots and it only works once, and it's only attack two, right? Because most people can just move two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. What? But yeah. What are you currently using on the drill with the, in your hands? Uh, like the poison dagger and nothing else, because I really want a whole bunch of items, but we haven't gone back to Frost Haven. Yeah, okay. That's true. So is this something you'd actually consider replacing that and not getting anything else? Maybe. I'm thinking either this, uh, the giant sword, which was on my maybe list, which is the uh, just the next item along, which um, you get plus two to your attack, but you can't move. Yeah. Um, or I want the unfettered arm. Yeah, you did mention that. Uh, yeah, 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 because that solves really my like um that that solves my my um my miss um thing as well. So, um yeah, I, look maybe maybe I might I might give it a go. How about as a test? Why not? I'll take it and we'll test it out and we'll see if it's any good and then we yeah, can, okay. can confirm this. One of the few times we actually test out an item that we put on our shit list to see yep. if it would be useful or not. Yeah, um, it's your AMD though. You realize that? Oh, it's a hundred percent chance to miss, but the whole thing is it'll move it forward. Like, is it, oh, the so pull, you the, just want a two-handed item that you can use once that pulls something towards you. Why not? Sure. <laughs> Wait, um, there's, I, there's another I, I, Is that? Uh, I was just going to say, um, the ones that I was... Uh, there was another one, that I think it was the chain uh, that I was looking at. The hook chain. But I don't mm. know how much... Because um, that's going to pull too on all, all, it, all your range attacks. <laughs> you know what? What I've done, I've read the hooked chain and then read the harpoon and gone like, they're same, the same thing. Ah. Uh. So no. that's why I've looked at it and gone like I, on your range attacks. So yeah, um, no, no. In in saying all of that, I 100 percent agree with everything that you said. I'm going to test it though to see yeah. if there are some niche possibilities that I might be able to make it work. Work. All right, I'll test it. So we'll buy one. Each. Um, but why last? <laughs> no, I'll, one? I, I, I'll I'll buy the fish fish hook and we'll try that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the wave blade. <laughs> yeah, by the wave blade. Let's see how we go. <laughs> we won't have any water for the rest of the uh, the, the campaign. Um, my last one is the Titan Nail, which is number 208. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And the reason is, is that this is like, for all the reasons the giant piranha pig spine is good, this is not good. Okay. One extra pierce isn't worth the extra conditions of it needing to be under 4 HP or less. Okay. So you can only get pierce 3 on something that has four HP or less. I can see when you're mentioning the um, living, living spirits. spirits and stuff like that. So this Flame is like limits. for killing those things. That's that's fine, right? Um, so like maybe it falls more into the category of the Abyss Axe, where it's like, great, if you're fighting a particular item, uh, sorry, monster, um, and then outside of that, you just don't take it. Sure, mm. maybe it's 35 gold, kind of easy to get. Um, 
And the, I guess the only other advantage is that it's an attack ability, not a melee attack ability. So you can, mm. again, use it on range. So, again, it kind of creates that situation. But you've still got to be able to do the damage. So, you know, it's not like the fish hook where we're talking about, like, it's insta-kill onto something that um, just has that, be- that health or below. Like, if they've got 3 HP or 4 HP, yeah, PS3 is great, but you're still going to be doing 4 damage, and it's not adding the wound on there, so it's not adding that extra benefit of, like, oh, I didn't kill it, I got through most of the shields, but it's going to slowly tick away. Um, so, yeah, and again, like, two hands. Uh, like, if you had, again, a utility item, something that just said, on your next <laughs> attack, right, or a potion, even a, a bag slot item, a bag slot item on your next attack, right, gain PS3 if the uh, monster has 4 HP or less, you'd be like, I could see a world where I take that maybe, right? And that's not a competitive lot. I mean, that's a competitive slot because there's so many good items to go in it, but you get three, four, five of these, mm. right? Whereas that this is taking a two-handed slot, uh, bo- sorry, both <laughs> two hands. So it's taking both your hand slots and it's competing with everything else in that in that category. I can at least see the niche utilization of a bag item for characters are like, ah, I don't usually have heaps of necessary bag items to take. So I can probably take this or have it there as a just in case and bring it for those scenarios. It sounds like you really want a belt slot. Like yeah. Batman utility belt. You know, here's my little pierce needle and here's my... Uh, region thing and my card swappy I don't know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I do. I, I think I think it's something that would add. Like, um, I've all, I always feel like in games that giving people more choices, mm. right? Um, it just enriches the uh, experience, and and that's maybe how my brain works as well in regards to having lots of puzzle pieces and seeing like how can I combine them or what niche ability could I use in this situation to like you know kind of help us out. Um, yeah. and it's. I think having um, something that is there, like a slot there that doesn't have damage on it, it doesn't have conditions on it, it doesn't have movement on it, like those things are really good. Movement, um, shield, damage, conditions, they're all really good. Okay, and I just don't think you could put them on these, but it's things like we talked about last week, like the door opening stick, um, you know, or this thing that gives um, pierce on something that's like in a certain situation, um, or even the, the wave blade. Like, in this really niche situation, you can carry this item and there's going to be occasions where it might work. Yeah. You know, and that would be cool because then it's more that it means those items see more play and the items seeing more play means that that's like everyone has like a, a, a richer kind of yeah. um, experience. There's an extra um, layer there. Yeah. The only problem is you have to be really careful because then you create another slot and then you, everything has a best in slot. Yeah. So you can kind of create this situation where you've now got this thing and everyone, like, these are the top five items you take in that slot because they're always useful. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think it should be added in. I'm just saying stuff and I'm not a game designer. That's why I think people <laughs> smarter than me make these things up. But uh, this just feels to me there's a whole bunch of really, really cool abilities on items that we've gone through and I'd love to see them in the game more, but they're just overshadowed by things that are really good yeah you're right and i and it's like oh I, they whoever came up with this amazing like great thinking i love the design space it's just never gonna see play yeah and that's exactly why you know we like some of the items like wave blade and all that i'm glad they're in the game i'm glad they're because it means someone has thought about this and put it down and they haven't gone too far in the oh let's just add a couple of extra stats on there to make it you know really niche and really weird but also really strong where yeah it becomes the best in slot but yeah keep playing with the system um, and and coming up with very interesting interactions. Mm. Uh, that was fun. That was fun. Two handed. Uh, where are we going next? By the way, are we are we going feet? Uh, yeah. Let's let's do feet. Let's do feet next. Well, what, what have we done head? so far? We've done head, Shoulders, chest, knees, and toes. Well, that's in the order, yeah. So feet and then bag items. Yeah. Oh, bag items is going to be interesting. That place. Bag huge. items will have to have some caveats. We'll remove some out because they're just the best, right? Like removing power potions, removing um, the well, stamp maybe we pots. Split it into potions and then not potions. Yeah, possibly. I still think we remove healing potions, <laughs> stamp pots, and um, and power pots because they're. Don't remove them. Just don't 
do them. That's what you mean, right? Yeah, th- yeah, that's what I mean. I seen saying like, okay, there's a disclaimer that these are the best, um, and they're always going to be taken by everybody. So let's look at the other items that are cool. Oh, well, I may throw a curveball, and in my shit list, maybe the power potion, the second one, the major one. Good there, yeah, because it's terrible, know, it's terrible, it's broken. Mm-hmm. We will wrap it up there. We've almost ticked over. Oh, we're almost ticked over two hours. Oh, I'm so Although sorry, with the everybody. Intro. I kind of, I was just really no, no, today. no, no, no. It's fine. It was fun. Uh, join us next week with Smash Through 97 again, and maybe to take a look at the finale of the chain with Scenario 98. We are getting very close. Until then, I've been your host, Eddie. I've been joining in my guests. And remember, when it comes to rolling terribly, use a digital app. (laughs) 